Добрый день. Мы рады сегодня видеть всех вас на очень важном для нас мероприятии. На мероприятии, которое, ну, я уверена, что не оставит безразличным многих не только в этом зале, а и тех, кто смотрит нас в интернете, и тех, кто увидит фидбэк. Who will see the feedback of what we will be talking about today? My name is Yanina Sakalova, and I am happy to welcome you uh, at uh, uh, the ECA City Health Leadership Forum. Today we really have a very nice morning. We are in a beautiful theater, and that is uh, like a masterpiece of new technologies, which we would like to see also in healthcare, especially at the municipal level. And I would like to point out that the geography of our participant is really impressive. It's from Tajikistan to Switzerland. It's Ukraine, Moldova, Bulgaria, Kazakhstan, Switzerland, Germany. Georgia, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Montenegro, over 50 cities from all over the world. I think that we should give a, a round of applause to all these people. And uh, summing up, uh, I would like to say that representatives of all, uh, almost all the Eastern Europe and Central Asia uh, countries are here and the best experts of uh, uh, the region are here at this forum. So we'll have uh, two languages uh, uh, here uh, and it's uh, kind of unusual for me to speak uh, Russian because uh, I uh, lived uh, in a Russian speaking city uh, like uh, 15 years ago and used to speak Russian. So we'll uh, have uh, English and Russian today. Uh, so I hope that you will all feel uh, comfortable. In the hall, we have a poster uh, exhibition about the initiative Fast uh, Track Cities, about Amsterdam, uh, Kiev, and Almaty, and uh, uh, Urashura uh, stand with the rapid test. So right here, you can uh, get tested for HIV right at this forum, and in 15 minutes, you will know your result. And according to the experts, Quick could be a perfect option for people who cannot or do not want to go uh, to the formal healthcare facilities. And I will uh, tell you as a secret that uh, uh, when we were preparing this uh, leadership forum, I used this small package. It is not scary, really, because for many Ukrainians, uh, getting tested for HIV seems uh, scary. And I'm sure that it will be a, a step forward to uh, curbing the AIDS epidemic. So he will talk about in innovation, technologies, and political leadership of the mayors of the cities uh, in achieving the world free from AIDS. And the main focus of the forum is on the strength of the cities, uh, which uh, strengthen their resources every day. And we are thankful for organizations of this uh, forum, uh, Alliance for Public Health, with the direct support of the mayor of Kiev and Kiev city administration. So uh, applause, please. In partnership uh, with a joint uh, UN program uh, on HIV uh, and uh, uh, so UNAIDS and the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB and malaria. So applause to you. Thanks for supporting us. And I want to add that for over 20 years, Alliance for Public Health has been one of the biggest non-governmental organizations in the world, which in cooperation with the, the government and civil society partners, they have been doing a lot. And let's uh, give them a round of applause again for that. I will add uh, that uh, uh, with its activities, the uh, Alliance supports over 250,000 uh, people from key populations, and uh, uh, this indicator is the highest uh, in Europe. It is good to know that today uh, new leaders take over the responsibility for health. Those are mayors of the cities and municipal teams in the cities. So today we will talk a lot about the successes achieved in Ukraine and I'm happy uh, to welcome here mayors of the cities and municipal organizations. Thanks for joining us. 
And uh, right now, I would like uh, uh, to ask one of uh, the mayors to come to this scene, leader of the city, uh, which has a strong position in uh, fighting uh, HIV and does uh, a lot to uh, organize this forum and to let people know and uh, make sure that people are not afraid of preventing infections and uh, to remember uh, that we can curb and control HIV if we know how. So uh, welcome uh, uh, Vitaly Klitschko, the mayor of Kiev, on this scene. I would like to welcome uh, you all. Uh, I would like to welcome all the colleagues, mayors of the cities. Thanks for finding time uh, to come to this very uh, important forum on very important issues because uh, transmission of HIV is the key problem of urban population. I am happy to uh, welcome representatives of municipalities who are here with us today, as well as experts who are here to talk uh, about a very important uh, uh, topic, uh, our health. So health, how to protect it and how to fight with dangerous diseases and how uh, to resolve the issues which are important for us, how to fight uh, HIV, tuberculosis. Unfortunately, uh, the region of uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia where uh, the epidemic of HIV continues growing and the situation with the tuberculosis uh, is uh, pretty severe and uh, according to the number of those diseases those this region is unfortunately one of the leaders uh, why is it so important to talk about those uh, challenges at the level of cities and municipalities now as 50% uh, percent of global population lives in the cities, and according to the experts, in 30 years, uh, the uh, percentage of people living in uh, the cities will be 70%. Percent. In the cities, most uh, uh, infections uh, are concentrated, and at the same time, the cities have the required infrastructure, have the resources to prevent those diseases and to treat them. I am happy that mayors of different cities who uh, are here today and some people who were not being able to come uh, due to objective reasons, I'm happy that they realize that overcoming dangerous uh, diseases is possible through joint efforts. And uh, for this purpose, we signed the uh, Paris Declaration, Zero TB Declaration, and other uh, signatories uh, are joining those declarations. And I'm sure that cities are able to minimize and overcome the global threats to humanity, such as uh, AIDS and tuberculosis. And the question of uh, health of the citizens cannot be uh, the prerogative of uh, certain ministries only or some departments. Uh, I'm sure that the health of population should be the main priority in the municipal uh, policy and uh, uh, for each mayor to ensure well-being of people in the cities. That's our priority. Kiev signed the Paris Declaration in 2016 and we approved and fund our city program. We work, first of all, with the most vulnerable populations in terms of uh, HIV. And thanks to our work, the number of new HIV infections in our city of Kiev uh, is uh, gradually going down. Uh, and talking about the 1990 targets, which are the priorities, uh, the city of Kiev today can report uh, on uh, such uh, numbers as uh, 72, 80, 90. This is a very good indicator, and I'm sure that we will see even more positive dynamics. So for us, it is very important to share knowledge with our international partners, 
because a lot has been done uh, with uh, using new approaches and innovative uh, techniques. Today, uh, here in this uh, hall, we have oh, over 150 uh, participants, 10 mayors and vice mayors of the cities, representatives of uh, 50 cities from 25 uh, countries. And also, we have uh, the best uh, experts in HIV and in tuberculosis, and here we have representatives of the strongest communities. So this is a unique opportunity to share knowledge, to share new ideas and discuss the challenges that we are facing. And that is a great opportunity to establish new contacts to join our efforts in fighting the challenges that we see and that our society sees. So I wish you all productive work. I am happy uh, to see you and I am happy that this forum takes place in our city and I will be happy to share uh, our experience with you and I am sure that the results of this forum in the nearest future will be uh, visible and will uh, influence uh, the improved health of uh, people in our cities and in our the communities. So thank you, and I wish you all a great forum. Thank you. Thank you, the mayor of Kiev, uh, Vitaly Klitschko. And by the way, uh, Vitaly, do you know that uh, down there you can get tested for HIV? I see in your eyes that you are almost uh, agreed to do it. Would you like to do it? I can go with you and I can hold your hand so that you're not scared. Well, mayor of the city always shows with his own example uh, what to do. Uh, that's not a secret. So uh, we are happy that the equipment which we have here in Kiev allows to uh, rapidly see the results of such tests. It uh, makes uh, the uh, goals of fighting HIV more achievable. And if we, uh, we have such a suggestion, I will be happy to set my example. Thank you. The mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko. And our forum goes on. Dear friends, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dmitry Latichesko, the regional uh, manager for ECAR region from the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. So, your applause, friends. A uh, good morning. Thanks for coming. So, the floor is yours. A uh, good morning. The Global Fund was created by the global community in 2000. And uh, in this short period of time, uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Central Asia received uh, over 200.5 uh, uh, billion. And we see the first successes. But when the mayor and the champion, uh, Vitaly Klitschko, is talking about 1990 targets, we know that the final victory uh, is uh, very close. So we support such important events uh, as this forum, and we wish you all productive work. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, uh, dear friends, we are now coming to the main uh, information block of our uh, forum, and we'll talk about the achievements and the process in the municipal response to the epidemics in the ECAR region. So what uh, are the activities which are evidence-based and which give the results? What are those results and what can we expect in the future? So to answer these questions, I would like to invite to the scene the person uh, whom I'm sure most of you know. Uh, about over 20 years ago, he initiated the creation of Alliance for Public Health, and he is uh, the executive director of Alliance until now. So in 2000, 18 Alliance, uh, with his leadership, became uh, the only organization in Central Euro Asia and Eastern Europe which received accreditation of Frontline AIDS UK based on 38 standards. So please uh, applause. So an ambitious leader in response to HIV and tuberculosis, uh, an innovator and a real missionary. So please meet uh, Executive Director of Alliance for Public Health, Andrei Klepikov.
a good morning. You will not see a presentation. We will create it all together. We will look at where we are now and what we can do with it. So in our region, the epidemic of HIV is still growing. One million seven hundred thousand uh, people uh, in the region of uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia live with HIV. As for tuberculosis, there are 259,000 of TB cases registered every year. New infections in our region are growing at a quick pace. It's 20, 23% uh, of growth uh, every year. We uh, usually associate uh, HIV and AIDS uh, with African countries, but in Africa we see a different uh, trend. So uh, there are, uh, there is a decreasing number of new infections every year. We see it, and for us, it is a signal that something is wrong and that we need to do something about it. In our region, the key populations are drivers of the epidemic. So new HIV cases in over 40% of cases are attributed uh, to injecting drug use about 30%. This year and last year were associated with partners of key populations. About 20% of new HIV cases are associated with the, with the group of men who have sex with men. And there are other groups too who are out of the main statistics, but they are extremely vulnerable, such as transgender people. And we see here a man, and it's not by chance because it is men who are uh, two times more popular than HIV positive women in our region, while it is believed that women are generally more vulnerable to the infection. 90-90-90 targets. We've been speaking about those and the situation in the region is in the regions is much worse than in Kiev. Uh, the first 90 is actually 72 percent HIV positive people who know about their status. But how many of HIV positive people receive treatment? Just 38 percent. That's less than a half. That's about one third instead of 100. And that's a huge problem for our region. For even smaller number of people, this treatment is effective. That is, reduces the viral load until undetectable. Uh, the situation with tuberculosis is even more dramatic. As I've said, 260,000 new cases of tuberculosis are registered every year. Out of them, 30% are cases of MDR-TB. We see that the situation in the region is worse than elsewhere in the world with the MDR-TB. And now multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is the biggest problem in the context. Uh, on the right, you see the column that uh, describes our region. Look at it. Near it, you see figures explaining the situation around the world. And out of every new case in the world, only 3% are MDRTB. In uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, that's 18%, six times higher. And if we speak about uh, the repeatedly treated tuberculosis, that's 54 percent. I was at the high level meeting of the UN when, where we had uh, different public officials from different regions, including ours. And when this information sounded, 
uh, when it was voiced and when they understood that a public official very high rank he really was a mystery. He said, he turned and said, what the fuck is that? And that's truly so. It's difficult to find the words. You don't need to reinterpret it additionally. Why? Because the situation is not just worse than everywhere in the world. It's six times worse in our region. But don't start nodding like everything is so bad. It's not so bad. We are not here not to pity ourselves or complain about the situation. We are here to find solutions. And there can be at least two solutions. First, don't forget about yourself. The problem of HIV and tuberculosis is not someone else's problem. It's our problem, yours and mine. You cannot use some other people to change it. If you want to change something, ask yourself what I, what I am going to do about it today or tomorrow. Don't forget asking this question every day. Not what they are going to do about it, what we are going, what I am going to do about it. That's probably the most important point because without this movement, without these, this uh, ownership, this is going to be someone else's problem for you. And the second point, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources to do some Shit. We are here to use as much effective solution as possible. The solutions that have proven to be the best, those that produce the best results. And in fact, that's up to the cities. Because in the cities, uh, well, there are about one-third of all HIV-positive people, like in Sofia or Tbilisi, in the cities like Kyiv, we have more HIV-positive people than in whole countries such as Georgia. And that is why the city itself needs to resolve the tasks uh, that are similar to the national or even exceeding those. Sometimes when we beat the epidemic in the city, we can then control it in the whole of the country. If we look at Ukraine, for instance, if you are able to control the epidemic in five city, uh, cities, Kiev, Odessa, Dnipro, Krivir, Rih, and Mariupol, we are going to be able to stop the epidemic in the country. So our focus on the cities is the key in resolving the problem. Uh, now, talking about methodology, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have uh, the working principles allowing reaching fast track to, in our response to HIV and tuberculosis. So we've been working in the cities for years, and we know that there is a model that uh, can produce a real result. First is the focus on key populations, key groups. Second is focus on the services that bring uh, the real results. And the third is policies, working with decision makers and uh, policy makers. And finally, that's uh, exchange of experience sharing the best practices. That's what's been effective in the cities. And let me tell you, the work with the key groups, uh, for example, in the city of Sumi, they now have a free drug use room with our support. In the city of Odessa, drug stores are involved in uh, harm reduction programs that they, you can get free of charge syringes there. In the city of Almaty, they now have a safe uh, room, safe environment for uh, key populations such as LGBT or other groups. So in every city, actually, where we work, there is a couple of lawyers 
helping people with legal counseling, working with youth is a whole new set of issues. People of 15 years or 16, you cannot come up to them with uh, newspapers or leaflets. There is a method that we have piloted in Kiev, drugstore. It's a project where we are, don't even identify ourselves as the alliance. No one's interested in that. There is a different brand, something that draws the attraction of the young people. Okay, maybe some uh, grand old lady uh, would be scared of it, but uh, we're, those old ladies are not our target audience. And the young people, they want to contact uh, this boss to get inside, to get counseling to learn what they need to learn, and such things must work and be scaled up. If we want to move somewhere, if we want to reach the risk groups uh, and who are very vulnerable, those are young people experimenting with sex and drugs. Drugstore is also a telegram channel. It's a resource that's available online. Everyone can download an app, a free to ask application, and get advice, get counseling at any time of the day. Talking about the cascade, I would say that uh, the cases that uh, go missing, they uh, go undetected. Uh, is another big problem, and the case of Almaty shows how rapid testing allowed uh, detecting 1,500 new cases, actually. So they just, uh, like, uh, made uh, this test mobile. Uh, the, it's mobile with the means of a social worker, of an outreach worker. You don't have to go to polyclinic. Uh, a social worker, an NGO person can go to the people who truly need testing. Moreover, you don't need to bring some logs or notebooks. Uh, you got a Cyrix cloud system that allows you to see in real time who has received services and what was the scope of the services and where it happened. So that's also shifting the traditional work, the conventional approach to the new technology, to the new way of doing things. Um, in Kyiv, we went even further than that. We've started using uh, the artificial intelligence to uh, look for the most risky cases of uh, HIV infections. That's a unique development. We sometimes see it when we go to Amazon, for instance, and we, when we buy something, we will get immediately the advice like all oh, people who buy this book usually buy that book too. That's actually the way we can use the experience not just of the social worker but also expect that the uh, AI would calculate uh, and uh, inform us about where there is the most uh, infections, uh, and uh, th those are the recent infections, three, four months, uh, up to six months, uh, uh, they are the most contagious, uh, providing the highest risk of infection new people. As this way, we reach to the most dangerous vectors of the disease. So, returning to the Almaty case, Yes, uh, there we have a situation when a case manager brings the person from the diagnosis to the following steps, uh, further diagnosis and uh, linking up to care. Uh, they even have uh, this uh, special term, uh, people who are lost to, uh, su to support, lost to care, uh, we don't need lost people. We need people who get treatment, and in Almaty we see 1,500 of people who were detected. They all have been linked to care. In Odessa, that's uh, tuberculosis, and uh, I've spoken about that, and Odessa is not an exception. It's a standard case when we started our work that was to have the effectiveness of treatment at 
50 percent. And after our discussion with the mayor, a decision was made on how to drastically improve the effectiveness. There were several ways for that. First was to provide primary care level treatment. You don't need to go to some tuberculosis dispensary somewhere far away. You are not uh, contagious if you have started treatment already. So by reducing this uh, level by dropping down to the primary care level, we were able to improve the effectiveness of the treatment. Second is motivation. It is popular to say uh, that the money follow the patient. I don't care where they follow. The most important thing is that they bring the result. And the incentive uh, was used to be just 13 hryvnias for every contact with the patient. And for the final curing. That's 50 cents, but it is these resources that allowed us to improve the effectiveness uh, to reach uh, all more than 70 percent, and in our project where we implemented that uh, to 90 percent. That's a fantastic result. In uh, Balti, Moldova, we see the example of uh, integrated services. You don't need to travel around the city to get one service and another service and the third service. If you need uh, tuberculosis, losses, uh, SMT, counseling, ART services, now you can get it all in one place, at one site. It's not the patient who needs to travel around uh, the cities following doctors. The services follow the patient provided based on the needs of the patient. Needs of uh, the person, needs of the individual. Uh, so business, uh, uh, they have client-oriented approach. And in healthcare, we also need to use it. It is also a technology that we need to implement. And in Balti, it showed uh, a result uh, of a cure rate at 90%. As for the our policies and politicians. For us, signing political declarations, Paris Declaration, for example, is the commitment that uh, the mayors undertake. Yes, uh, this is an issue. And by signing this declaration, I commit to resolving this issue. The same goes for the zero TB declaration. So zero TB cases is the aim. Tuberculosis is a curable disease. We uh, see that in uh, 2017, when we started, uh, there were only several uh, cities who joined this initiative. And every year, uh, there are more and more cities joining. Now, at this point, there are 14 cities uh, which signed Paris Declaration and four cities which signed zero to be a declaration. But today, a little bit later, uh, this number will go up. So uh, as for the resources, uh, of course, uh, they should be available. And we see that uh, by signing declarations, uh, cities, uh, uh, they uh, approve municipal programs uh, for HIV, tuberculosis, sometimes also hepatitis. Balti, which before that never had any allocations from the municipal budget, uh, they approved a city program and started funding. Adessa allocated $2.5 million for three years from the, for the municipal program on HIV TB. That's a great result. And uh, our cities, they are not very poor, uh, especially considering the decentralization process and the, the municipal resources are to be utilized. As for the knowledge exchange, uh, that's what allowed uh, to someone uh, to get inspired, for someone to see how it works. It's like after the visit to Bern, when uh, the mayors were able to see uh, how programs for injecting drug users uh, work. Uh, so they do not have HIV transmission among uh, injecting drug users. There are no criminal activities there. Why not to use this experience here? 
Also, here we can talk about uh, the cities conference, International City Health Conference. For the first time, we brought this international conference to our region. Last year, it was organized in Odessa. There were over 30 countries represented there. And we can talk about such programs as Harm Reduction Academy. They change uh, the mentality and approach of uh, people in particular uh, in their, their attitudes to key populations. Results are important for us. And the results are uh, decrease the incidence of HIV, TB cases, and the main thing is uh, uh, saving lives. We see that those programs not just function, but uh, they bring results. And those results are lives and fates of uh, people, people living in the cities. Uh, so cities are a perspective uh, area of activities and we need to invest uh, more there invest money invest resources invest uh, time and the drive we plan to extend the list of cities including at least 25 more cities and we are open all those things that we work on they are not for me they are for you and all people who are interested to get any support from us on how to work in the cities or elsewhere, we are ready to provide such support. We are open. And as for the cities, it is important to remember that uh, curbing the epidemic in the countries is possible through working at the municipal level. Cities can change the situation in our countries, not just some abstract cities, but mayors, leaders of the cities, and all of us citizens. For us, for us, it is our way forward. And I would like to end my uh, speech with the slogan of our new uh, project, In Your Power. It is in your power. It is in our power. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Thank you, Andrei. You know, I was listening to you, and thank you for being honest, for being very direct. I think that in our country and in Europe, in the world, I think that we need to speak really directly, because otherwise people will not listen to you if you do not speak in such a sincere and direct manner. You know, I wanted to ask you, because in my interviews I, I like to speak about uncomfortable things, uh, so today I think that uh, people will also uh, pay attention to it. So when we talk about cancer because we have a uh, Yanina Foundation because of uh, my former disease uh, and now I work uh, on this project a lot so we analyze why people don't do uh, check up uh, for cancer and the majority of people said that it's easier for me like this I don't know about the disease and if I know about my diagnosis I will know that I will die so why should I think about tomorrow if I can just live today so here we have mayors of the cities, municipal authorities. So how can we raise the awareness and inform people through social advertising, maybe through media, that it's not scary and it is a way to health tomorrow? So what should be the argument? Because I'm sure that you did some psychological research on this topic, right? Yeah. And the main barrier, really, is uh, the psychological fear of people to learn about their diagnosis. Uh, because people think, and what's next? What will be the consequences? Uh, the scientific progress now is at the point when if a person takes medicines, uh, the viral load is undetectable. It's not possible to transmit the virus, HIV, and it has no negative uh, consequences for the body. And it's a real breakthrough because just five years ago, there were no such high quality uh, medicines. They were not available. So uh, psychologically and mentally, what we need to focus on uh, is that treatment is available. 
because we are used to saying that AIDS is the plague of the 20th century, but it's not uh, so, and we are not in the 20th century anymore. Uh, HIV is just a chronic disease, and uh, tuberculosis is actually a curable disease. So that's nonsense that the world still cannot eliminate tuberculosis. So they decided to do it by 2030. Uh, so for HIV and for TB to eliminate those diseases. But be because TB, you can just treat it and forget about it. And summing it up, I think that there are uh, some people who will talk also to the mayors of other cities. So you're not afraid uh, to say who ignores us, right? Are there any cities where this issue is very relevant? Uh, but uh, the municipal authorities, uh, they are not ready to cooperate. If it is like that, I would like you to talk about it and the mass media present at the press briefing to uh, focus on it. Uh, that's important. Well, I would like to be constructive and I would like to say that in Ukraine, the region and the city uh, which we need to focus on is uh, Dnipropetrovsk region and uh, Dnieper city. So in our uh, region, the Russian Federation is the main driver of the, uh, this epidemic, unfortunately. Because in Ukraine, we controlled the epidemic and the new uh, cases of HIV are going down. But in the region, it is going up because of the Russian Federation. And mainly, it is due to the stereotypes. Because some people say that, let's say that we have no gay people. We have no drug users. They are bad. Let's not help them. Let's not talk about human rights. So they can work for some people, but if a, a person is a transgender a person, or if it's a sex worker, or if it's a drug user, so for him, human uh, rights are maybe are not relevant. And that's the scary thing when the ideology takes over science. Because there are methodologies approved by the World Health Organization. Uh, so I talked about the approaches they work and will continue talking about it. So if such evidence-based approaches are not used because of ideology, that's the scary thing. And that's what we need to focus on. Thank you, Andrei. Thank you for fighting. Thank you for presenting. And I'm sure that today uh, we all learned a lot about what's going on in Ukraine and what we still need to do. So, Andrei Klepikov, your applause, please. Thank you. And I want to add that really it's evident uh, after we listen to our speakers uh, that the leading position in the fight uh, with HIV uh, TB uh, belongs to municipal approaches because they take into account a lot of regional and mental uh, peculiarities like the situation with uh, the Dnipro city. It was a confirmation for me. Uh, and uh, the, one of the most effective approaches uh, in fighting HIV and TB at the municipal level is signing Paris uh, Declaration and Zero to B Declaration. So the cities get uh, a ready to use strategy and can strengthen the municipal programs on HIV and tuberculosis. It uh, greatly simplifies uh, the work both for the executive bodies and uh, health departments at the local level. So we'll talk about it and about many other things within our next discussion panel, which is called Leadership of the Mayors in Response to HIV and TB. So let's give a round of applause uh, to Raman Galevich, uh, Director of UNAIDS. Uh, in Ukraine, and uh, uh, Luchika Dittio, Executive Director of Stop TB Partnership. Hey, good morning. I, I probably have to invite all the mayors. Yeah, we're waiting. So, Luchika, Luchika Dittio. Uh, Luchika, please join us. Okay, so uh, Luchika has to have her microphone. Wow. Uh, you have, is it Ukrainian or is it not Ukrainian, the ornament? 
Oh, on your clothes. Okay, well, let's think that it is Ukrainian. Yeah, it's, it sounds patriotic. Super. Let's go. Uh, let's start them. So my name is Roman, and uh, I am happy to present uh, the joint uh, UN uh, program on uh, uh, AIDS uh, at this forum and uh, at this panel discussion. Uh, and after the high-tech presentation by Andrei Klepikov, probably we'll need to have some holograms of the leaders here. But uh, the best thing is also is always face-to-face -face communication. So you will see uh, real people now here. And they are our key uh, speakers today. And every mayor uh, works uh, with, with their teams and will uh, talk uh, in the afternoon about how the teams in the cities work. But now we will have an opportunity to speak to the leaders of those municipal teams. So I would like to uh, invite here Mayor of the Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko. <laughs> Uh, Mayor of Bern, Alec van Grafenried. Uh, Mayor of Odessa, Gennady Truhanov. Mayor of Chisinau, Ion Cheban. Uh, Mayor of uh, Svetlogorsk, Dmitry Alinikov. Mayor of Soligorsk, Andrei Zhailovich. Vice Mayor of Bishkek, Tatyana Kuznetsova. Vice Mayor of Belsi, Nikolai Grigorishin. And Vice Mayor of Osh, Nurbek Kadyrov. Please take your seats. Yeah, well, considering the fact that here we have an Olympic champion, we are not going to and a lot of uh, preparation. Let's start with the uh, hosting uh, city, the city that in 2016 was the first in post-Soviet countries that joined the Paris Declaration, I mean Kyiv. Uh, Vitaly, please, you signed the Paris Declaration uh, three years ago, and now three years have passed. Are you satisfied with the results? Do you hear me? Yeah. So, hello again, and I'd like to welcome you all. You are right in many instances. The city of Kyiv has been showing good results. And with regard to the Olympic medal, that was my dream. Uh, but uh, actually, Vladimir won it, my brother, so you confused us again, sorry. Uh, he is also an activist in uh, these efforts as well, by the way, helping people who need help for many years. He's been supporting the work of many fund foundations, including foundations, Ukrainian ones, working on overcoming the challenges Ukraine meets. And we're, our municipality, and my, um, well, I have the task as a mayor to do everything I can to help uh, the civil society organizations, uh, charitable foundations, uh, by uh, creating good uh, environment for them to join the efforts to resolve these problems, not to work secretly, because usually public servants are not very much interested 
when there are NGOs who can produce the results, who can have the control, who have the ownership, who are better integrated in solutions, then they deliver the results. Today I've already said that the city of Kyiv is currently um, very good in, in our progress in fighting AIDS and today we are signing the declaration on fighting tuberculosis and I am sure that jointly well, we see that in the last years we have been uh, achieving very good progress in increasing the number of people receiving uh, care and prevention and well in and in our fight with this serious challenge for our city uh, when I, I am talking to the mayors of different cities and towns as the head of the Association of Ukrainian Cities. Uh, I, I see that we are showing the good example and we are ready to make uh, all efforts to scale up this very positive experience to disseminate it around Ukraine because unfortunately we still have a lot of challenges. So let us then switch to your uh, colleague from the city of Bern, that's one of the first cities presented here who encountered the, the problem of um, drug use and HIV. So I have a question to you, considering that mayors often do not want to and um, deal with such unpopular things as uh, drug use. How have you been able to support this uh, intervention, such as a free, uh, safe room uh, for drug use? Because that's not something people uh, in the street or your voters are very keen to do. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for organizing all this uh, alliance and global fund, and of course, uh, Vitaly. Um, <clears throat> well. Um, I'm very glad to be here with my um, mayor colleagues, um, my fellow mayors. Um, mayors, um, mayors are no politicians, but mayors are problem solvers, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, we we have to we simply have to if if we have a road with a pothole, um, then we have to fill up the pothole. Otherwise, we are not elected in the, the next day. So so mayors have to solve the problems. And if Bern has a longer experience uh, in, in that field, this is not because we are any better than, than other cities, but we had huge problems. It was the, the biggest political problems uh, in Switzerland, in Swiss cities, uh, back in the 80s. And, and from then on, uh, as we had the problems, the mayors had to, uh, to react. And, and we reacted in Bern very, very strongly. And maybe I cannot uh, say that in, in three minutes. Maybe I will be a little bit longer um, in, in telling the stories, what we did in the last uh, 30 years. And I will focus on the people uh, <clears throat> on, on the drug, drug addicted, uh, heroin addicted people uh, in Bern. This was a huge problem in Bern back in the 80s, and it was a, a bigger problem that it, than it is here because I was uh, in Kiev from, from yesterday and I haven't seen uh, a single person drug addicted uh, in the streets of, of Kiev. Um, when, you, when you came to Bern back in the 80s, you would have seen them because they were in the streets, they were around the city center, and they were. They were hundreds. Uh, so, so they were very present in the streets and they were, it was a brick misery and we had to react. So we focused on this group and as I, if I understood well, uh, it's the, the most vulnerable group today in your cities and it's, it's the most, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's the, biggest, the biggest amount of, of the problem of HIV prevention. Uh, this drug uh, population. In Bern it was uh, heroin, heroin addicted and heroin addicted they uh, inject heroin um, and, and they <coughs> injection happens with, uh, with dirty syringes so if you have a hospital that uses dirty syringe, syringes it will be closed uh, at once of course because uh, a hospital that uses uh, dirty syringe, syringes is, isn't worth nothing so uh, First, you have to, to, to offer clean syringes. This, this, is the, this is very basic. So what we first did with, is giving 
for free uh, <coughs> clean syringes to, to, to everybody in the streets so they could use clean syringes. Uh, so, so that is the very first step. The second step is uh, to, to talk to the people and to go to the people. And you, can, you cannot see the people in the streets, but you know where they are. They are where the drug market is, so you have to go on the drug market. Um, and there is, this is very, this, now it gets very complicated for everybody because it gets complicated for the police and for the justice because drugs are illegal. And you have to go to the people, you have to speak to the uh, people without arresting them. Because, um, <clears throat> and this is maybe the most uh, difficult part for, for politicians, politicians have to understand that these people are addicted, but basically they are ill. It is an illness, they are, they are sick. Uh, because they are addicted of drugs. It's not because they just want to have drugs because it's fun. They have drugs because they are ill. And it's an illness and you have to cure them like, uh, and you have to treat them like, like ill and they are, they, are, they are very heavy ill. So um, <clears throat> what we did next is uh, that we offered them a room where they were protected, where they were protected from, uh, from crime and, and from, from everything. These were uh, consumption rooms, consumption injection rooms uh, in the city. It had to be in the city center, like the, the, the HIV um, center we saw, uh, we saw this morning. It needs to be in the city center so they can go there and they can meet there, they can inject there, they can get clean uh, syringes. And then we started to offer and to widen up even uh, the offer. We uh, offered them medical uh, assistance, we offered them social assistance, so they came off the streets. And as I said, it was the biggest problem in Swiss cities because they were on the streets and they were, they were seeable for, for, for everybody. And, and, and we, we got them off the streets in the injection rooms and in the medical and in the social uh, programs. We didn't say uh, we will cure you, uh, you will not longer uh, have any, any uh, drugs, but we accepted uh, that they will have uh, drugs. And this is the basis of the Swiss four-pillar drug policy. We have, as, as everybody, we have the same drug policy. We have, of course, prevention, which is the most, most important pillar. You don't want to get people into drug addiction. We have the second pillar, that is uh, repression. We, we don't have uh, drug abuse is illegal, and, and so we have police to, to, uh, to have repression. Then we have therapy. And the fourth pillar, this is now the most innovative and the, and the most important pillar, is the, uh, the pillar of harm reduction. They are, they are ill, they live in the streets, and we want to reduce harm. And this is a very uh, human and a very social uh, approach. We want, to, we want to help those people. We want, to peop we want to get those people off the streets. We want to get those people in, in livable and, and in, in, in social uh, circumstances, and, and that's what we do. The end of, of the story now is that, um, <clears throat> that we in Switzerland offer them drugs, either methadone programs or heroin programs. We, the Swiss state even buys heroin to give to the drug uh, addicts. But they, live, they are in programs, so they come in the morning at 8 o'clock, they get their heroin, and then they even can, can go to work, or they, they can leave, live a very regular uh, social life. And they will not hang around uh, in front of the station. They will not be uh, criminal to, to, to get the money to buy the drugs, uh, and they will not uh, end up in, in, in prostitution. Uh, so, so we regularized them. Um, and what the bottom line is, is that the numbers of drug addicted uh, in Switzerland goes down. Of course, the number of HIV <laughs> uh, infected goes dramatically uh, down. Tuberculosis is, is no longer a problem in, uh, in Switzerland at all. Um, so I would say, if I uh, speak of the, <clears throat> of the indicator, uh, Switzerland is a um, after 30 years now, uh, after a long way, and after a, a, a very hard way also, uh, Switzerland now is at, at uh, 100, 100, 100. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the progress of Switzerland is really amazing, and uh, we don't understand why Bern is the site. Yeah, well, we actually see why uh, it's uh, the site to learn from. 
Uh, yes, I know that Odessa city is also the city that encounters problem of HIV and drug use. And I know that they traveled to Bern together with the mayor of Odessa. So my question to the mayor of Odessa. So what did you see in uh, Odessa? What impressed you and what you could take from their experience? Thank you. Good evening. Good afternoon and thank you for this question in Bern we were impressed by everything <laughs> uh, and if we speak about your question about the topic uh, first of all that's uh, the safe injection room it was a shock when we first uh, when there I imagined uh, opening such a room in Odessa and I was uh, a bit horrified. I saw the, those, uh, you know, titles in the press on the websites about what we do in the city. But then shock has passed uh, after I heard about this new philosophy and new approach to fighting this evil, the drug addiction and drug sale. Uh, HIV epidemic and so on and I'm really thankful to Jakob present here who conducted trainings with us uh, and to, I'd like to say thanks to my colleague the mayor of Bern for that detailed explanation of where we, they started and how they uh, came to the situation they have now. So I think the first thing that needs to be changed is philosophy and that's exactly what uh, my uh, colleague has just said those people, we call them narcomans, people with drug addiction, they are ill. It's not criminal. They are not uh, criminals. They are people in need of treatment. And only after we are able to socialize them, to make them understand the society is not their enemy, they will come to us and they will seek the opportunities to get treatment. That's the biggest lesson we learned in Switzerland. And you know, Janina, when she started our forum, she asked, like, what, how can we motivate other cities uh, in Ukraine to sign Zero to Be Declaration or the Paris Declaration? And the response is very easy, very easy, at least for me. And that's what uh, uh, drove me when I signed the declaration. You know, the mayors of cities uh, in Ukraine, uh, they are being evaluated uh, based uh, on what's going on in the cities, like the infrastructure, housing, uh, like transport uh, and the environment in the city. That's all important. But if we go too deep down there, we can make sure that our cities, uh, they are clean and nice with good roads, but at some point they, it can be possible that there are no people to walk in those beautiful parks. Considering the transmission of all the dangerous infections in the world, because the infections and the drug use, uh, they uh, do not know any borders, nationalities, religions, and the infections, they do not uh, look uh, at like if a person is rich or poor. Uh, that's a problem of everyone. So that's why we need uh, not only uh, to engage into our direct uh, uh, like activities, but also make sure that our medical workers, health workers, uh, the can do their work effectively. In Odessa, we approved a municipal program, and for the first time, we allocated money to support it. We consolidated uh, civil society, business, uh, health practitioners. So today, we are with you, and we can talk about some uh, serious achievements in the cure of tuberculosis. Uh, so from 53% to 72%, uh, the cure rates grew, and also we can talk about about HIV detections. And uh, I heard that uh, uh, Andre uh, Klepikov uh, uh, talked about the achievements of Adiasa, also I will not repeat what he said. And of course, I remember what I promised to my colleague, uh, the mayor of Bern, that we will open a safe injecting room in Adiasa, and of course, I will invite you when we do that. 
I remember about it and we will do it. Thank you. So uh, the letter of uh, the city of Sumy, uh, they already did it, but uh, well, I'm probably monopolized the, the mic, so Chica. Um, so I want to ask you, sir, in Odessa, because Odessa is the only city in Ukraine that uh, uh, signed the Zero TV. And indeed, uh, Andre, in the presentation, which by the way, was state of the art. And uh, thank you, sir, for hosting here. And I think, yes, we need to applaud the way how this meeting was organized, the many of the mayors here, but also using new technology and creating this vibe of the future. So that was really awesome. And I know it's not easy to make it, so well done, whomever is behind this. But going, uh, going uh, because we've been in more important houses and this didn't happen. So I'm very pleased to see this in Kiev being Romanian and the neighbor here. So, you know, this, uh, you, Andrei mentioned some of the great things that happened on TB. I just want to ask, you know, the fact that you signed the declaration generated more enthusiasm, more attention, more, if you can just share a few thoughts on that from, from your side, sir, or more actions on TB. Uh, thank you, Chica, for the question. Of course, again, I would like to repeat, and we need to talk about it uh, repeatedly, that after our meeting and after we signed the Zero TB Declaration, in Odessa, really, we consolidated all uh, the those uh, organizations and stakeholders uh, who were working on fighting those challenges. So we consolidated our efforts and we planned our future activities uh, on how to detect infections and how to treat infections. And today I said that uh, we had uh, about 50% uh, of uh, cure rate for tuberculosis. And today, we are talking about 72%. And that was a short period of time. So it is really a success story. And the main thing is that we proved, thanks to you, thanks to our conferences and fora, thanks to Alliance for Public Health, and all uh, people who are present here today, we have proved that in our city, uh, we had a TB a treatment uh, clinic. It was centralized and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, like uh, inpatient departments there. It was closed. And when such uh, health facilities are closed, people feel concerned. They don't know what to do because uh, those people with tuberculosis, they, they were kind of in closed settings in those inpatient departments. And uh, the society was kind of concerned, like, what what is going on now? Will they people be in the street? But today, people have no fear, and we have proved uh, that not only uh, we can use beds in hospitals to fight uh, those, those challenges, and the results that we see today is a big confirmation of it. And the main thing that I wanted to say is that there were some questions. Uh, we have Irina uh, Kutsenka here, who is a deputy of Odessa City Council, and she was the initiator uh, of uh, uh, the city program uh, to be approved at the level of municipality. It was The process of approval was not smooth. We did a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, uh, talking, and there were a lot of old-fashioned arguments. But uh, on it was our third session, after two sessions of discussion, on the third session, we were uh, able to approve the program because the uh, local deputies first, they were not ready. But thanks to you, thanks to your efforts and uh, all the resources and experience uh, and the evidence based which we see in our in other countries, we were able to approve the program to allocate budget. And today, everybody can see the results of our work. And that's the main thing. Thank you. And I like the fact that you outlined the challenges when you have to go with something new forward. And for those of you more familiar, Minister of Health of South Africa, South Africa is putting a lot of their own domestic budgets into rolling out big uh, scale up for TB and HIV domestic. And he has challenges with the Minister of Finance, right, big time. And the way how he's breaking them up was when he was asked, can we afford this? Can we afford? His answer is always, we cannot afford not to do it because it's not about us, it's about our people. 
So I'm moving now uh, to uh, my uh, co-national, I would say, uh, from Chisinau, sir. Well, uh, we can speak uh, in Romanian, but I think it's uh, healthier to speak in uh, English and have translation. Uh, for uh, Chisinau, if you can uh, tell us a few things about uh, how do you see a healthy Chisinau and uh, the work that is happening there on HIV and TB. Radio Svitata. Uh, saying in Ukrainian, uh, happy to see you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank Mayor of Kiev for uh, gathering us together and uh, hosting this event and organizing to make it possible. So, we were told that we have only three minutes to speak, <laughs> so I will try to be very concise. Здравствуйте еще раз. Uh, good morning uh, again, and I w there are several uh, important things uh, that I would like to mention. First of all, it's uh, high-quality treatment and prevention of HIV, and uh, it uh, starts uh, with the uh, vulnerable populations, uh, and also uh, it is about the general population of people living in our cities. So what is important for us to do uh, is to make sure that people who already live with HIV, they can live long lives and they can get old uh, to make sure that mothers uh, with HIV can give birth to healthy children. It is possible today and the population uh, could be able to get tested for HIV to know their status. Talking about young people, we need to focus our attention on young people, on youth, because we need to be honest, uh, because we see what is happening. Uh, sometimes we don't uh, see what is happening, but still it does. And we need to talk about the ways of HIV transmission. And of course, we need to come up with the methods of prevention, uh, including condoms. And it is good, not only in the context of HIV, but also other infections and diseases which are sexually transmitted. As for the drug use and drug addiction, uh, I think that we need to focus here on uh, the syringe exchange programs. And today, by the way, in Chisinau, we are starting a PrEP program, so pre-exposure prevent prophylaxis of HIV, and my colleagues will tell about it later. But in fact, it is an important step for those people who are at risk. Uh, to make sure uh, that uh, those people are not uh, infected with HIV. As for tuberculosis, there are a lot of things to be done. And we hope for partnership and cooperation. And uh, thank you, Vitali, Roman, Lucia. Thanks uh, for joining us and bringing us all to uh, together. And I want to say that uh, with my colleagues and my friends, uh, so from the mayor's office, we'll probably go and get tested. <laughs> Thank you for your response. Okay, so Luchika uh, mentioned uh, uh, that uh, about her countrymen, and uh, so I would like to ask uh, my countryman, uh, a person from Belarus, Dmitry Alenikov from Svetlogorsk. Uh, so when I started working with uh, uh, the UN, HIV was often associated with uh, Svetlogorsk. Uh, for what I understand, now the situation in the city is better, but my uh, question is about a different thing. So it is sometimes difficult to get mayors personally involved in the issues of HIV and TB. And Svetlogorsk signed Paris Declaration just a week ago. So what was the arguments for you to do it? Thank you. 
Thank you for your question. Well, of course, I've got a speech here prepared by my assistants, but I would like to uh, use a different format. I would like to thank you for organizing such forum. Uh, because Svetlogorsk is a small town uh, with uh, 80,000 of population and from the Soviet uh, times uh, so AIDS and drug use were big issues there and I think people who were at this post uh, before me uh, for not uh, being silent about those issues. It was easy for us to sign uh, this uh, declaration and we will achieve the 1990 targets. I'm sure about that. It was easy because we are not uh, keeping silent. We work on it, we deal with it. This problem is not new for us and we will resolve it, I am sure. Today I'm offered to sign the zero TB declaration and I was thinking, should I sign it or not? But I should, I should. Uh, because we need to uh, really uh, get people engaged because there are mayors, municipalities, there is certain administrative resource. If we don't talk about it, nobody will talk about it because what are the issues of the population? Like to make sure that they have uh, good houses, good roads, uh, but there is also a problem of health and sometimes we don't talk enough about them. So today, meeting, today, conversation is important. So I want to address uh, my colleagues, uh, my mayors, because uh, there should have been more people here on stage signing uh, the declarations, because we undertake certain obligations and commitments which we will meet. And we will engage other people who have to work on it, like medical professionals and other uh, specialists. And again, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this forum. You did a big uh, job. And uh, I was thinking like uh, when uh, uh, Andri uh, Klipika was using some F words, like people, they were energized, I saw. So he was able to bring attention of people to this issue. And we need to do that, to have this dialogue, not to hide uh, this uh, situation. So in Svetlogorsk, we have uh, an injecting drug user who has AIDS from 1997, and he's alive. He has uh, rather good health, and uh, hopefully he will live much more years, uh, thanks to us not being silent about this issue. Because I asked the chief sanitary doctor, asked him how many uh, syringes we exchange in 11 months, because uh, that's uh, some part of my job. He says 468,000 syringes. We just got 82,000 uh, people in the small town of Svetlogorsk, so mo almost half a million. So don't be silent about the problem sign the declaration. Thank you. Yeah, the, the town is small, but it's important because it's an industrial town and it also depends on the scale and location of the problem. And I know another small town, Soligorsk, and the mayor of the city has not signed the declaration yet, but is going to do it soon. What's your reasoning? How is it going to help you resolve the problem that you've been dealing with for years? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank the Alliance because uh, I'm, I've recently become the mayor of Soligorsk, but in the first months of my work, the Alliance visited me and they uh, provided very good explanation because I, I had never even heard about the problem but they explained to me in detail what's going on what can be done what is already done and what uh, experience there is moreover the, my colleagues in Soligorsk told me about how it worked in my town yes we do have a regional program it's been implemented well and the alliance uh, also confirms that it's uh, of a good quality program, but if we speak about signing the Paris Declaration, that's probably a very good way to use the ex international experience uh, using the effective tools that have proven their effectiveness to resolve the problem much faster. And that's why we are here probably to hear about the international experience and try some 
mechanisms that are already being used by our colleagues. Uh, so, yes, that's what we hope for. Thank you. And then let us probably switch from Soligorsk several kilometers to the several thousand kilometers to the east uh, to Bishkek. And I have a question to Tatiana. Yes, uh, the drug uh, use uh, seen and uh, HIV infection are a huge stigma. And people don't really want to know about their diagnosis because they see what problems it will bring. Uh, but the task that we all trust, try to resolve strategically as a part of Paris Declaration is to make diagnosis as soon as, uh, as possible, uh, start treatment as soon as possible, and uh, let the person live a normal life like uh, people do in Sitlohorsk for more than 20 years. In your context in Bishkek, what do you do for people not to be afraid to learn about their diagnosis and start the treatment? Thank you very much. We are really pleased uh, to have a Kyrgyzstan representative this forum. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your invitation. I want to say that in July we signed the Paris Declaration and uh, it took us uh, a long time to reach this uh, step. Uh, there were some pros and cons and our international departments uh, took long to assess the situation, but uh, in the end the uh, municipality decided to sign the Paris Declaration because we uh, have been working with, uh, if you, Kyrgyzstan NGO, and a lot of work has been done by the municipality in the work with our civil society. And after after signing the Paris Declaration, we decided to develop a city-wide pro program and we invited in the working group not just the municipal structures, we also invited uh, the civil society and non-governmental organizations and uh, the uh, council members of Bishkek because every program needs to be supported in terms of finance and since uh, the uh, budget of the city is adopted by the city council we invited uh, the uh, members of the council to take part in development of the program so that they could see why we need the money and we encountered a lot of questions from both the civil society and uh, uh, councils, uh, why we need this program, why did you si sign this declaration? Okay, it's all very fine, but the problem is still there. And it's a problem not just of health care, it's a problem of, of municipality as well. That is why a program was uh, drafted and it's already passed hearings at the line committee. And we are trying to get about 10 million sums uh, from the city budget and this uh, this money will be provided through the city health care budget and talking about stigma in our personal experience at, as it's already been said here during the months dedicated to hiv and aids we urged all our uh, public servants to take the test and uh, in late uh, November, me personally and the uh, um, leaders of the m our municipality passed this test in. So, I, as I'm responsible for the social uh, sphere, I encouraged all the people working there to take the test. They did it, and uh, the um, people of the capital and the visitors could also join and I think that by giving our personal example we showed the people of Bishkek that this is something that you need to do. You need to learn about your status and it's the municipality who is responsible to do this because like this we, we do build trust to ourselves because uh, okay other problems Pro projects are also important, uh, green zones, building, new housing, like in Bishkek, for example, 
we have new cultural centers, but health, health is a core value. That is why the municipality is in support of the program we've drafted, and I think that uh, our council members will also support us. And as we are now willing to sign the zero TB, it's also important for us because the next stage is going to be the developing the city program for tuberculosis. So you are following well-tested uh, journey, right? As you observe. Uh, why is this uh, very awesome is not only that we have a lineup of uh, nine mayors of the cities, but we also have a conversation about TB. And as you observe as well from uh, the conversation, the mayors are much comfortable in discussing about HIV AIDS than about tuberculosis, okay? So those of us working in TB here, we should take this home and be very worried, right? But uh, because uh, the knowledge around TB, even though it's a disease that is with us for thousands of years, is much limited. And we never raised uh, the level of being at the conversations with enough political leaders. So that's why I am very grateful for you taking up this agenda, because TB is airborne, and TB is growing in the European region, including some cases in Switzerland, on uh, drug-resistant TB. And because we already construct a lot in what HIV AIDS movement, UNAIDS and all the partners constructed, so it's much easier to do a lot of TB HIV together rather than doing just by piecemeal. Because the person that is affected is one. The drug user that is exposed and infected with uh, HIV will easier uh, uh, get TB. The same with other co-infections. So if there are things put in motion for HIV or as a matter of fact for TB or other disease, it's much better to do together some things. And we have the mayor of Bolts with us uh, uh, today. And I know that uh, things um, in Bolts, uh, who is uh, one of the cities that uh, signed the Zero TB Declaration, and I see you are here with uh, some of your uh, teams, um, team members, uh, is doing a lot uh, on TB, but especially on TB HIV. And uh, so can you share us uh, a bit of uh, what's happening in Bolts and how you manage to really care for people with a lot of engagement of civil society? Dear mayors, dear guests, uh, in Belty we encountered this uh, problem. You mentioned politicians, not politicians. So, yeah, I'm proud that we have allocated 370,000 lei from uh, the uh, city budget to help this organization. But the politics is important here, and uh, I encountered that. Our political opponents, when they learned that we started talking about these things, that we are uh, supporting uh, opening a safe injection room, they started, yeah, well, I could say they started criticizing us, but that's too weak. Uh, they started uh, speaking different obscure things uh, about uh, us uh, supporting the, the, the drugs and uh, AIDS and prostitution. Yeah, I support the idea that the politicians must do politics. The problem in the city is the city's problem that we need to resolve. It's about the people who live in the city. Those uh, pe drug addicted people are our citizens. You cannot tell uh, their father or mother uh, that, uh, okay, that's a funny problem. Because in Belty we have now, like, you know, we all go to supermarkets, we all buy milk, water, bread. And I support the idea that in Belty we have a supermarket, whatever you call it, a supermarket, academy, institution, for people to go to and receive all range of services, starting with testing and ending with and ending with simple uh, communication, an opportunity to have a conversation with a psychologist, with other people. And I'd like to thank Vitali for showing us today this transparency they've ensured as they start with uh, analysis and then provide psychological support to such people. That's really great. And the mayor of Odessa mentioned that they will be first to open the uh, in safe injection room, but I think we can have a better since we'll be for the first. Uh, 
and then of course we'll spend more money for that. Yes, uh, we have the majority in the council, and the politicians who are just trying to win some more votes, they are wrong in doing that, but I think God help us. Yeah. Yes, in some uh, cities, uh, the mayor and the team are the teams of gods uh, who do impossible things, uh, even when they encounter uh, this uh, very severe and um, wrong critics. Uh, yes, but we have another uh, city in Kyrgyzstan, the town of Osh. Uh, this year they signed uh, the Paris Declaration. The problems are similar with other cities, but they're still different. What are your priorities? Good afternoon, dear participants. Uh, first, I'd like to say thanks for the organization of this event, a uh, very high level, surely, and thank you for the invitation because as a result, we get certain motivation, some positive approach and good international experience. And uh, after Bishkek, we also signed the Paris Declaration and we do certain work. Uh, we have implemented a two-year pro project for social procurement. We've allocated some budget from the municipality and the Coordination uh, Council has adopted a three-year plan for our <coughs> operations. Uh, we are going to adopt it soon at uh, the uh, city council meeting and uh, we are going to provide uh, local funds and to use donor support. Yes, we do have similar problems. But considering the, the fact that our country is in the Central Asia and it's a Muslim country, we have a huge problem of stigma and discrimination. And our program is basically aimed at prevention at uh, awareness raising of the population and after the donors uh, have left our country when uh, they their pro program was over we learned about the dynamics and there was a great increase in the incidence of the diseases. So I'd like to use this opportunity to talk to our international partners as they have huge experience and I'd like to invite them to our city, to our country. Uh, to discuss uh, our action plan and uh, how we're going to implement the Paris uh, Declaration. Today we also would like to sign the Zero TB Declaration. But uh, still, uh, if uh, we have the programs both for HIV and tuberculosis, I think that it will be uh, easier and more effective. Thank you. Uh, these are not empty works. It's actually pretty unique uh, that, and historical that you have uh, such a, a gathering uh, in uh, basically represented nine cities of the Eastern European region that are going forward. Uh, with their mayors in pushing uh, TB HIV out of their uh, cities. And uh, it never happened. We, uh, I am leading the Stop TB Partnership in Geneva, and uh, we are having uh, zero TB uh, cities all around the world. But it never happened at such a scale. And uh, it never happened uh, with uh, such openness and uh, with a very good discussion even here, because a lot of things were mentioned uh, about uh, this here. And uh, I appreciated very much what you said uh, uh, Mayor Vitali of uh, Kiev, on the, on the fact that uh, we should work with civil society and with uh, uh, NGOs and with the people affected uh, to ensure that we are able to achieve what we have to achieve. And I appreciated as well some of the other comments in saying that the mayors are the ones that are basically solving the problems. And I want to remind all of us that the mayors have, a, as mayors, a not very long lifespan, right? So speed is very important and speed is what we also need to see and need to have. I noticed uh, you want to, to add something. I'll just say a few more words and then I'll pass the word to, words to you. Um, and speed is very important because we have all a lot of targets to win. And uh, we have to end TB and HIV by 2030. And we have very strong targets to uh, achieve by the end of 2022 
uh, as uh, the UN high-level meeting on TB uh, expressed. Um, I want to say one thing. There is a test for TB as well. Uh, it's not the sexiest test possible because uh, you need to give blood. But still, uh, considering the fact that according to WHO, one in three people in the world is infected with TB, I encourage you that when you take the HIV test to take a TB test as well. We did a TB test in Geneva in our global health campus and I discovered uh, that I am infected with TB, even though, and it was the infection took uh, place in the last three years, uh, living in uh, Switzerland. Uh, so I got infected somewhere there, so you might have surprises. So we don't have right the tool that you can uh, do a test as quickly as others diseases, but you can do it for TB as well. Thank the you, last, Chica. Uh, I want to say just the last okay. thing. Okay, okay. Uh, we were divided into TB and HIV and so on. We are fighting this disease together because it's one patient. If we integrate, we can do much more. We send trucks to find people. We send uh, uh, different uh, tools that are available. Uh, we, send, uh, we have celebrities that are doing concerts and are organizing checking at the entrance to the concert through X-ray and through HIV. There are different models. So if there is a will, we will make it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and right now, uh, we will have a, a very important uh, moment uh, which will uh, enter the history. So now we'll have a record uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia right here on this scene. Uh, Six cities will sign the key political declarations to overcome TB and uh, uh, HIV. So that's Paris Declaration and Zero TB Declaration. So with your applause, I would like uh, to point out that uh, from uh, the Stop TB Partnership, uh, Executive uh, uh, Director Dr. Luchika Ditio will sign the Zero TB Declaration and Raman Galevich from UNAIDS will sign the Paris Declaration from UNAIDS. Are you ready? I see in your eyes that you are really ready. So if, according to the protocol, everything is ready and all the nuances have been met, we can start the ceremony with your applause, my friends. So everything is okay, right? All the formalities have been met. So for the ceremony of signing Zero TB uh, Declaration, I invite you, Luchika Ditio, and Mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko. A mayor of Kishinau, Ioan Cheban. Vice Mayor of Bishkek, Tatiana Kuznetsova. Vice Mayor of Osh, Nurbek Kadyrov. So my friends, keep uh, applauding, please, because we have a historical moment here. And Dmitry Alinikov, Mayor of Svetlogorsk, Belarus. So now we can start the signing procedure. I think that uh, the protocol service uh, people know better how to do it. So if we have some someone from this department, please help us so that we understand where to sign. I can tell you, Vitaly, of course, where you need to sign, but okay, you'll figure it out. Good, then let's give uh, a round of applause again to our signatories. I would like to remind you that uh, the Paris Declaration Initiative and Zero to Be Initiative are aimed at motivating uh, the cities of the world uh, to curb the epidemics of HIV and TB, making a focus on the importance of uh, leadership of cities, a combination of political will, uh, qualified experts, uh, and evidence-based uh, responses at the municipal level in HIV and TB response and active involvement of the key professionals. That's the recipe to end TB and HIV. And dear friends, for the signing ceremony, I would like to invite a Nikolai Grigorishin, Vice Mayor of Balti, Moldova. 
and Raman Galevich from UNAIDS. Please also join us. Okay, so we've got it. Okay, I'm told that we have some changes in terms of the signatories. Okay, but let's make it a secret, but we need to make sure that all the signatures are there. So if someone is here who knows how it should be signed, uh, please uh, check it. I would like to join the team of uh, Mayor Klitschko uh, and the protocol department. Uh, but uh, so far, I am just a host of this forum. In fact, it is actually a very important uh, and key moment, which I am sure will get us closer to resolving uh, this uh, problem. And please all stay on stage to make a photo all together. And the photographers uh, who are here with us, please make photos. And also, you can use your cell phones. So please help us to understand where we need to sign. Norbek Kadyrov, Vice Mayor of Osh, Kyrgyzstan, is now signing the declaration. Thank you very much, and the mayor of Svetlogorsk, Belarus, Dmitry Alenikov. So please come and put your signature on the declaration. Thank you, and Nikolai Grigorishin, Vice Mayor of Balti, Moldova. We invite you for signing the declaration.
and Roman Galevich from UNA is also put his signature. So, dear friends, that's a very important moment at our today's forum. declarations have been signed thank you everyone so Vitaly Klitschko asked me to give him the floor for a couple of words so please Vitaly uh, as uh, the hosting party I would like to thank all the mayors who took part in today's uh, forum uh, so I know, as no one else, that uh, every mayor, every representative of the municipality, have we all have a lot of problems in our cities, a lot of challenges that we need to resolve uh, to make sure that our people live comfortably in our cities. But let's not forget that one of the key criteria we have been talking about from the scene is health, health of all of us, health of the citizens of our cities. And it is very important today to join the, the efforts to resolve those issues, not to do it undercover. And despite the fact that between uh, Svetlogorsk and Bishkek there are several thousand kilometers, but the issues are uh, sometimes uh, similar. So our world is global uh, and it is the borders, uh, they become more and more transparent. So there are a lot of people who move and relocate from one city to another, from one country to another. And it means that the problems and challenges uh, are that we have are global. So and also there are challenges of the mayors who are here on the scene. And also for those people who were not able to join our forum due to some reasons. So again, I would like uh, as a hosting party to say thank you to each one of you for finding time and coming to the beautiful city of Kiev. I really hope that you'll have a chance uh, to uh, visit it. And uh, I organized the good weather for you today. <laughs> And we really hope that you will be able to enjoy our great city and also learn about some things that we have already achieved in fighting those challenges we've been talking about uh, at this stage. So, uh, from the picture, yes, let's take a picture to make this moment to remember. And dear friends, let me remind you that signing these declarations is uh, definitely not just a moment that we write about, but uh, that's a responsibility for the cities because it uh, opens uh, the cities the, experience, the way to access uh, experience uh, of uh, international organizations in and other cities in fighting tuberculosis. And on this uh, good note, I'd like to announce uh, the uh, lunch until f 2 o'clock, but I'd like to ask Vitaly to stay here for the press conference and Andrei Klepikov from the Alliance of, for Public Health, Jan Cheban, uh, Mayor of Kishinev, Vice Mayor of Bishkek, Alec von Graf, Rent, uh, um, uh, Mayor of the Bern, Luchika Dittiu, and Roman uh, Galevich will hold this press conference and media welcomed here. Please, everyone I've mentioned, right now remain here with Alikichko and
Добрый день всем снова. Надеюсь, что... So, dear participants, uh, I hope that everyone who uh, are still taking the, having their lunch, uh, they, they will join us really soon. Our ECA City Health Leadership Forum continues, and now we are going to speak about the innovative cases, prevention, and stopping epidemics, the means that the cities need right away. Fast track city means that it can overcome HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis faster than the average. So there are technology practices uh, and uh, guides, guidelines in the world which allow you to work faster and more effectively. The next session is about such technology that has been tested in Europe, Asia. We will speak about the specific cases involving particular people. The growth of the epidemic of HIV and tuberculosis in, uh, in the region is very much related to the behavioral risks, including uh, the injection drug use. Uh, according to the expert estimates, more than 3 million uh, people in our region uh, consume injection drugs of uh, economic depression, low income, uh, poor quality drugs, uh, inability to work with the problem of drug addiction as a medical problem, have all led to spread of the HIV. The average rate of prevalence of HIV in ECA countries uh, is 20 times higher than around the world. So while the Western Europe has already encountered this problem and uh, they have the understanding that they just cannot make people all stop using drugs, they have uh, created special environment for drug users where they, their health suffers much less. For example, in 1986 in Bern in the Central Park, uh, the drug-dependent people were sitting around in the, in the park uh, and uh, the, the infection was taken a large spread. So what did burn people do? Let's look at what happened there. In the beginning of 1980s, when the city of Bern was marked by an open drug scene, the first safe consumption room was opened. The goal was to get the addicts of the streets away from the open drug scene. They were allowed to consume their drugs under supervision, safe from the police, something that was a global novelty at the time. It was a revolutionary step in addiction work. Before the work was focused on abstinence only, you need to have a ticket. That means you need to have the will to change towards abstinence, to get access to support programs and help. And then we said, no, it's okay. We work with people where they are right now. This is the important part that they survive right now and that we can get them into support programs later with the contact we have established. This is the safe consumption room. Here we always have a team member working for an hour, supervising and supporting people. There are three different offers, the smoking room, the sniffing corner and the injection room. There are eight places for users who inject. For them, it is important that they wash their hands when they come in. There are clean needles. They can come over here and take a clean spoon. We also offer the ointment and bandages for after the injection. The drug consumers then take their clean materials to one of the places. There, they can prepare the drugs which they have brought with them. We do not hand out drugs here. We offer ascorbic acid, which they can use to heat up their drugs, clean injection materials, alcohol wipes to disinfect the veins, and the needle disposal to leave the closed needles in after. After consumption, People have to clean their place with water, and after that, the team disinfects it with special disinfectant, again, to make really sure that nobody can get infected with any illnesses. It is not that easy for us, because according to the law, it is clear dealing, possession, and consumption of drugs is prohibited. 
In consequence, this means that we have to close one eye and stay watchful with the other. We tolerate, as we say, and deals between addicts. That means that dealing a very small amounts needed to consume. For me, the safe consumption room has become a meeting point for like-minded people. A place where you feel accepted, comfortable and safe, not discriminated against and prosecuted. Here you can use clean needles and other utensils, get medical care. As far as I remember, the operators of the contact point and safe consumption room and we as the police had very different opinions and approaches towards the drug scene, drug addicts and police work in general. But then, from 1986 onwards, this was massively corrected, because we saw this can only work through dialogue. And this is why we have a good drug situation these days. From 1989 onwards, the country of Bern definitely approved the contact point and safe consumption room. But the addicts first had to get used to the new institution as well. According to the operator, the foundation contact practically all severely addicted people in the region of Bern are reached. Bern doesn't have an open drug scene any longer. That's worth some applause. Uh, uh, friends, so the um, hero of this video, the uh, former director of uh, Contact Burn, the first NGO was to open the first uh, harm reduction office, uh, is here. Uh, this is uh, Jacob Huber. We are going to speak English now, so whoever needs translation, you can turn your headsets on. I was impressed. It's super. But uh, for us, it's very important to understand what was the start of idea to do this. What was inspiration for you? How do you understand that people should trust you? Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, you have to see, uh, we were really in an incredible difficult situation with open drug scenes. And all what happened was repression, repression, repression. We had some rehabilitation, but the people were in the parks. The people were dying. We had this HIV uh, difficulty. And then we can say... We were stocked with the drug policy. We were stocked with all what we did. And we realized we have to do something new. Mm -hmm. And what we did, we opened at that time only a shelter, a shelter with, with no consumption. So the people, the, the drug addicts that came, they had two pos three possibilities with injecting. They had the possibility to go to the toilet that we didn't want, that is dangerous, in our toilet. The second, they had to go out. And to go out in the streets, uh, the police was there. And the third, they told us, why can't we inject here? And the big revolution that happened, that we said, yes, you can inject supervised in this room. So no more HIV, no more overdose dying, and um, the police was out there and waited for the people and they didn't come. So uh, uh, this was a revolutionary pass in drug policy in that time in Switzerland and globally, mm -hmm. globally. Mm -hmm. So it was the users told us, and we listened to the users, and we... Uh, our foundation was so brave, I can say, so brave to decide, yes, we do it without knowing what happens, if we will be closed tomorrow or not. And what about uh, Ukraine? Frankly speaking, I can understand with all my experience that a lot of Ukrainians 
Uh, don't trust to come. Don't trust to start something new, especially with drugs. It's a close story for uh, a lot of citizens of my country. Uh, what is your advice uh, of this successful story to Ukrainians? How to be open for trust to the citizens of our country? What is the case? What is the way? <clears throat> the way was, first of all, to do it. Just do it. Just start. Just Don't, try. Yeah. Just try. Don't talk anymore. We talk here, we talk on a lot of conferences. I'm talking about 40 years in different places. Just start. And one other thing is important. You have to look for alliances. That means you have to see if what you will do will be defended by some important alliances. So, for example, for if the mayor is behind, it's already a great thing. If you have some journalists, they are, they are thinking that's not a bad thing. And you have to show what's going wrong today mm -hmm. and what you do better for your people, for your sons, for your um, uh, daughters, and people will understand the moment you do something that is done also for society. You see, if, if you only, do, you only uh, say, we do something for, I say, drug addicts, it's a big discussion coming on. But if you say, we do something for us, for society, for example, in Bern, in, in, in always this uh, safe consumption group, you, you can say, we have public order, we have security in the streets, and we do something that is really um, successful against HIV, against overdose and death, and for our sons and our children. So you never will have a consensus, never in society. But if you start, society has a problem. Mm -hmm. I say they have a moral problem. If you start, it will be disgusted, discussed. And you have to try to keep it open. You have to try to go on. And we, we fought, I fought, I, I thought one day I will die. I just will die because I can't stand it anymore. We fought five years, five years in Bern all alone in Switzerland alone, globally alone. Law said it's not possible, but we kept it open. And with the time, society gets used to it. And now, in Switzerland, it's clear we want to have these services. And the greatest alliance we have, the greatest one you saw on the, on the picture, yeah. is our police, because the police says that's really something we couldn't resolve and we, in, uh, we understand that are sick people and these sick people have to have help. As far as I know, uh, in Ukraine, in the city, a uh, name Sume. The project uh, is a successful uh, launch. Let's uh, discuss it and some facts about, uh, about this uh, new team, uh, new inspiration for all the cities uh, who will uh, there uh, with uh, head of this city. Yes, uh, congratulations to Sumi. Because yeah, Sumi, congratulations, Sumi. Yeah, yeah, a big Guys, applause, a big applause. Because this is the first, it. the first safe injection room in Eastern Europe. Yeah, in Eastern and Europe. So in, not only in Ukraine, in Eastern in Europe. In Eastern Europe. Oh, I have super. No, uh, I, I, I have never seen a safe injection consumption room in in Eastern Europe. That's the first one, mm -hmm. and there exactly the same uh, started. There were. After my, uh, what I have seen, three um, very important alliances. First, an NGO that said, we want to do that. Second, uh, the police chief that mm -hmm. said, okay, we do it. And a hospital. And third, in the administration, there are people who say that could work. Mm -hmm. Could work. So we try. So they started. Uh, you know, uh it's uh, 
very important to understand how did you manage uh, to get us uh, to support of the municipality in a such uh, a provocative and difficult, difficult experiment. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a good question. Maybe I can say something uh, that is uh, maybe different from here, but we have uh, in, in, in Switzerland uh, participative democracy. So okay. we, <laughs> have, we have a parliament and, in this, and also in the, in the government of the city of Bern, you have people who are responsible for ministries and uh, for example, the social and medical ministry of Bern is always was since. 40 years, it's led by a social democrat. And the left-wing parties are for a lot of things in Switzerland. So they are for, uh, I say, they, they would uh, legalize all drugs. Mm -hmm. And the right-wing parties, they say, no, this doesn't work. So there... There, you know, we put with doing it, with doing If you uh, continue to discuss, then uh, nothing happens. So they fight, they say it's against, it's for. So doing it, you put uh, a difficulty in this, uh, uh, I say, social force field. Mm -hmm. And this social force field never, never is in a consensus. Only. 60% uh, in four, 40% against. So you have to, to try to, to find the key where you can start new things mm -hmm. that are difficult for society. And one, one thing we had in our uh, government, we had, for example, the Minister of Health in, in Bern. He was uh, first time. He said, that's great. The, the police... Uh, Minister, he said, I will close tomorrow. And you see, they sit together and one says, open. The other said, close it. The other said, and then the, what was very important, we were very, very success, uh, successful because within three days, within three days, the people from the streets were, when we were open, all in the consumption room. So the population of Bern, for example, restaurants, uh, uh, that are in, in the old city. And, um, and people who were um, just out, they said, that's probably not bad what they do because we don't have any more the people uh, under our, um, uh, in our streets. We don't, and, and so, and they do something against us. They do something for HIV. Maybe it's better than what we did until now. We have to, we have to try new ways. And... Here, you do the same. You try to involve people that are important, to build up alliances. Mm -hmm. But start before you are 100% sure that it could work. Start before. If you have 51%, you think it could work, start. Yes, then it's... Uh, it's on the way you, you start to integrate. You know, society always has problems with integrating new things. And only integrates because new things happen. But if they don't happen, nothing happens. So we walk around, we speak a lot, we are in nice hotels, we, we have good food, very nice food in Ukraine. I can travel. Yeah. And so, not only but food. For the uses, for not the only use. food, Jacob. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. But for the uses, uh, very, very few. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob Huber, former director of Content Bern. Спасибо вам большое. Can I say once? Yes. You, you will stop. Yes. You will stop. Okay. You want to stop me? Uh, frankly, yes. But yes, if, yes, if yes. you would like, yes, yes, yes. We have a corruption story I, I with just, you. <laughs> I just want to say one thing more. We did a lot of, of other things. You see, uh, our mayor said we we started also the first with heroin uh, substitution. We started mm -hmm. the first with really drug checking, and uh, we invented a lot of things. So I say, I say we have. This is very good. We have to do something for health and for social integration for the people. But as long, as long as we have prohibition, as long we have prohibition, this bullshit continues. Mm -hmm. 
and all what we yeah. have, you know? You're right. Yeah. So what we have to do, we have to regulate the whole drug market by the state. We have to take responsibility and to get the people away from black market. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do, this is our responsibility, because we push our people into this kind of drug use, yes. of criminality, and of health, yes. bad health. Right. And that, some people say, that is criminal. We are the criminals. The, we are the yeah. criminals, you know? So go, 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 go further on. The next step is cannabis regulation. Yes. We have to regulate cannabis the next yes. step. Yes. And then we have to regulate cocaine. Uh, so we have to go on. And okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Peace. Thank you very much. About cannabis, a huge thank you very much, because I have a cancer this year, and I know with all my experience that this is a very big problem for us, and cannabis, uh, it's, it's the main topic now uh, for, uh, for cancer patients, but our government uh, now say no, not yet. So, thank you very much for these words. Jacob Huber, thanks. So now I will start uh, speaking Russian again. The story with you here. Okay. So in uh, Western Europe, uh, countries were able to control the epidemic of HIV due to massive implementation of uh, OST programs. Like in Germany, there are 80,000 of uh, drug users who take uh, substitution therapy. And in our region, we have the biggest program uh, in Ukraine uh, with about 11,000 people receiving uh, methadone and buprenorphine and those programs are fully uh, financed by the government and Kiev uh, allocated money from the city budget uh, to expand OST program in future so how this program works and what are the achievements and future plans to implement new technologies about all these things, we'll hear from Valentina Ginzburg, head of uh, the health departments in uh, Kiev uh, City State Administration. So we welcome you, uh, Valentina. So the, please take your seat. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would I like to welcome you in the heart of Ukraine, in the city of Kiev. And before starting to talk about our achievements, I would like to say what was our uh, situation before. In 2016, we had 2.9 million people in Kiev, and uh, the estimated number of Kiev residents is about 5 million. At the same time, uh, the estimated number of people who inject drugs is 33,000 uh, uh, people, those people who are registered as drug users. And 5,000 5, people are actually registered, and the estimated number is over 33,000. So in April 2016, Vitaly Klitschko uh, signed uh, the declaration to join Fast Track Initiative. And in December 2016, uh, the Kiev City Council approved the municipal uh, program to counter HIV. And uh, we can now speak what was done within this program about OST in particular. So one of the key tasks uh, under this program funded by local budget is to ensure sustainability of the OST program. And it is planned uh, to scale up the sites because in 2016 only 878 patients could receive this therapy from three uh, healthcare facilities at uh, six sites so we are now have having this task uh, before us of uh, scaling up the sites so that they could operate also through integrated care and uh, 
provides services in primary care institutions and in counseling facilities. Uh, joint efforts of the city and the donors have uh, allowed training uh, the medical personnel, uh, doing reconstructions, uh, providing equipment for the institutions, and the municipal budget uh, funded uh, this year already 300 courses of OST. As a result of that, is that currently we have. Uh, uh, 1,217 patients receiving OST, and we can say that uh, it is provided in 14 uh, healthcare facilities in 22 sites, including 15 at primary care. So this is the map of how it's going on. We speak about patient-centered model. So what's changed for the patients, and uh, why can we call it uh, patient-centered? model because uh, they used to spend an hour and a half uh, to reach uh, uh, the health care facility and so funding of uh, medicines uh, had to be reduced. So that's the sort of saving. Now we also understand that to minimize the number of people who have to buy it using out-of-pocket money. You see there are just uh, 49 patients, and 57% of the patients, they take uh, uh, OST drugs uh, unsupervised, but with the control of a doctor. So you see that we get uh, the drugs from the state, from the government, uh, and from the Global Fund. We don't just get the drugs, but we also receive support for uh, medical and social support, uh, and that uh, also uh, comes from the funds of PEPFAR. And local budget provides uh, salaries for the medical personnel, support of the sites, and procurement of the OST drugs. So let me clarify these drugs you've been mentioning. Uh, does it allow... Uh, 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 going uh, not not getting uh, the abstinence syndrome. Yes, these drugs they remove the syndrome and they also improve this uh, impulsive impulsive um, condition, uh, this craving, which is one of the symptoms of uh, these patients. And also, out of 1,217 patients, uh, 490 are HIV positive. And uh, here we say that uh, the OST is a tool for fast track because it creates adherence to receiving ART. And you see that uh, basically all the patients receive ART and uh, 695 uh, get uh, this, uh, these drugs for uh, unsupervised administration and talking about the conditions I'd like to show you a small uh, video showing that it's uh, open transparent uh, accessible so that's a, a patient friendly clinic these uh, offices are not different from any other offices and we call it uh, the office of integrated care because we understand that these patients may be HIV positive, they may have HIV associated uh, tuberculosis or hepatitis. So on the one hand, that reduces <laughs> this negative attitude to this group from the general population and for the patients who know what this is, they understand that it is there that they are going to get the um, integrated care that is important.
Yeah, there, there it is. Let's give a round of applause. Uh, well, it's important to know socially how much the life has changed after such uh, therapy for, for, for the citizens of Kiev. Well, I will probably continue with what the previous speaker said and will mention only the actual numbers. Uh, we know that it's um, health care and social care because 67 percent of people receive an OST are employed. That's very important. Uh, 14 percent receive a higher educa education, well, I mean university education, and uh, 32 percent of them have already got a family, and 21 ch children were born uh, with HIV negative status, I think this is the biggest achievement we've got. The quality of life of these patients, both medical and social. You know what? Uh, a different topic uh, that's important for me, understanding the specifics, because I analyzed that in the context of cancer, I know this. They need psychological support, uh, so mental component is important. I asked the previous speaker about how to uh, seed the trust among people to these uh, initiatives, but I'd like to ask you about a different thing. How I, a citizen of Kyiv, who is not like uh, active uh, Facebook users uh, and I have never seen the mayor's Facebook page or the municipality, how do you deliver this information to these people you want to help? I'm not going to speak about Facebook now. I'm going to say to you that the biggest task for us was that before the uh, Geneva Declaration, we only provided this care at specialized uh, healthcare facilities such as aid centers, uh, narcology dispensaries, tuberculosis dispensaries, because they are all interrelated. Then, in this time, we've achieved maximum decentralization of these services. What does that mean? Currently, in Kyiv, at any healthcare facility, starting with uh, ambulatory facilities, more than 40 of them, uh, counseling, diagnostic centers, all sorts of secondary uh, care uh, polyclinics, so they all provide you an opportunity to uh, give you a test and if required they prescribe ART. Now in the Council and Diagnostic Center we uh, well, we support that we provide care to uh, patients uh, who don't need to go to specialized institutions anymore. So this accessibility is, has been implemented. Uh, so probably by the word of mouth uh, they inform each other and it works, yes, exactly. So when the patient sees that it's not just like a friendly clinic, they actually see it. And when doctors are looking forward to meet them and are willing to provide all sorts of services free of charge, Yes, these joint efforts of the municipality and donors have brought this achievement. Today, two declarations have been signed, and at the end, I'd like to hear from you how, in future, you are planning to develop this program. Maybe something new that is going to be interesting to the people of Kiev and the mayors and representatives of other cities could borrow some experience of yours. Well. I don't think there are many uh, cities or towns in Kiev that have their own program because we don't have a national program to fight HIV or tuberculosis. And we have a five-year program with uh, the necessary funding. But in that video that I showed, yeah, we provide uh, like consideration of that, but we need uh, political will. The healthcare professionals are ready, uh, do, uh, patients are ready, uh, well, considering what has happened in this time, the accessibility has been ensured, but without joint efforts, without political will, um, implementing such decisions is not possible. And the program is uh, for five years with funding, with all the necessary events and measures, so we will just be 
keeping on improving the services. So I wish you the very best of luck, and I must cannot help asking. I understand that I must have asked uh, uh, the mayor, but yet I'll ask you. The previous speaker uh, spoke about the importance of legalization of the drugs and the medical cannabis. Again, uh, we must understand that it doesn't mean that uh, we, they will be smoking weed in uh, the airport of Barispol and people will be smoking uh, in the yards. No. What's the position about legalization? in Kiev uh, City uh, State Administration. I'm going to quote you later, by the way, somewhere, somewhere else. <coughs> well, i probably shown my position with uh, those achievements that we have got. Uh, you also that to achieve that at the level of the Department of Health, we adopted a number of orders which somehow pushed our leadership uh, of, uh, and management of healthcare facilities to implement these things so we, we are talking about. Uh, it's not easy, and we must first change the mentality of the whole population because now we need to train people, to educate them, to change their attitude to each other, and it starts with uh, parents and children and goes on and on and on and then we'll look in a different way at uh, cancer patients and HIV positive people because we must first see a person who because of some reason needs support of some sort. But without this education of the whole population we will never be able to implement these things that work according to evidence-based uh, healthcare approach. Uh, yeah, only by working together with the donors like we in Kiev do, and I must say that it's not just Global Fund who came to us, uh, but private investors too, uh, Pinchuk's fund, uh, they spend the money to buy the drugs for ART drugs, but on the other hand, we'll see today that when such a center operates a joint project of the city and private donors. It gives us the result. Thank you very much, Valentina Ginsburg, head of the Department of Health of Kiev City State Administration. Now we're going to discuss the next case, and it's going to be a very interesting speaker, just as interesting as the previous or the next one. What is special about today's speakers? Because they share their experience and suggest implementation of uh, their best practices in other cities too. The next case about is about tuberculosis. Uh, the Eastern Europe and Central Asia region is uh, rank highest rank in the region in terms of uh, tuberculosis, and especially MDR-TB, you know, it is poorly treatable, sometimes absolutely not treatable. Uh, in 30% of cases, it is because people interrupt their treatment courses. And uh, Odessa was one of the most problematic cities and regions in Ukraine in terms of tuberculosis, and uh, only a little bit more than a half of TB cases were cured. But uh, in several years, the city was able to improve uh, the treatment uh, efficiency rates uh, uh, to up to 70%. And how? Now I will ask a person who was directly involved. So here we. We've got Oksana Leoninka Bradetska, City Tuberculosis Treatment and Prevention Center, Odessa, uh, Chief Physician. Say hello, Oksana. So you can. Sorry, I start speaking Ukrainian sometimes. Uh, so you can use the pointer uh, to manage your uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to see you all. Uh, at this forum, and I want to say that uh, Odessa is a unique city. It is uh, not only the uh, 
the sea door to uh, our country and uh, uh, also center of migration, but it is also a resort and a touristic center. That is why we had a very complicated epidemic of uh, tuberculosis. It was a combination of sensitive uh, to be, which was uh, two thirds uh, of uh, all uh, the uh, all the. Uh, TB uh, cases detected and MDR plus XDR TB, which are hard to treat. Uh, and half of uh, uh, people had uh, a co infection, uh, tuberculosis and HIV. It is one of the highest indicators in Ukraine. So the situation that we had in our city, it actually made us look for some ways to resolve this problem. So after analyzing the situation, we came to a conclusion that in order to stop the epidemic, we need uh, to understand how the reservoir of uh, the TB infection uh, is formed. And it was not only about uh, the total screening, but also it was about uh, the uh, effective treatment of the patients. And here we had certain difficulties. But thanks to the Alliance for Public Health, political will, and political commitments of the mayor and his team, and support of Odessa City Council, the fast track program in Odessa included an activity which was called as DOT a therapy. Uh, at in the primary uh, healthcare settings. So we have a table here, maybe to support your words. Right. So you can see that most patients who interrupted uh, their, uh, we could see that most people who interrupted their treatment, they had reasons for that. First of all, that was about uh, low motivation among patients, and not understanding uh, uh, and understanding that there can be some critical consequences if uh, people start treatment. Also, it was uh, difficult to establish contact with homeless people who do not want to treat their tuberculosis. And there were other reasons which uh, made it problematic to achieve effective uh, treatment. So for many years, uh, we had about uh, from the treatment efficiency from 50 to 53 percent. Okay, so, Oksana, if you uh, could uh, use the pointer to change slides. Now we're still at this uh, slide. And so we, I, I wanted to talk about the low level of treatment success rate before the pilot. And also we only had three treatment sites where people could access to be treatment. And also there was a high level of uh, treatment and discontinuation after inpatient stage because we didn't have linkage between inpatient and outpatient stages. And also, as I have mentioned before, uh, there were no activities for homeless people. And also the fact that people with uh, a double or triple uh, pathologies, so uh, OST, ART, and TB treatment, they had to go to three different facilities. And it was a barrier. So thanks uh, to the support uh, of uh, all the stakeholders, our alliance, and our mayor's office and uh, city council, we were able to start a pilot project when we delegated uh, tuberculosis uh, treatment to primary health care settings. And during this pilot project, there were 88 nurses involved in this work. Uh, with a coverage of 759 patients in 11 primary health care centers. So what was it? Every nurse received uh, TB medicines and agreed with the patient how it will be convenient for him or her to receive the therapy. There were different options, uh, such as uh, bringing uh, the medicines uh, to the person's home uh, if he had problems with health, etc. Also, it was possible to have meetings with the patient at work, uh, or maybe the patients could come uh, to uh, the family uh, center uh, to pick up his or her drugs if he or she didn't want the nurse to come to his or her home. And for this, uh, the nurse get, got incentives. And the patient, after treatment completion, could receive 
uh, $20 uh, for food packages. Uh, so you see that uh, the services were available and accessible uh, to people. It allowed patients to save time and save financial resources because they didn't need to spend money for transportation. And patients were under follow-up of uh, a family a doctor to uh, track uh, side effects uh, and uh, also follow up uh, all the uh, other health problems. So can we see a video? Because we do have uh, a video to show how it happens. Today is November 16. I am Bandarenka Dmitry Yurievich, and I'm taking Teres Linazid and Glafazalid. Let's comment maybe. So is it a report? Is it a video report? Yes, it is a video report uh, which uh, nurse, uh, uh, nurses receive every day. Today is November 16, today is November 18, today is November 36. So you, we see that there are so many reports. So in a year, sensitive TB cure rates grew up by 20%. So that's how it happens. And here with us, we have a nurse who directly works with such patients. So I think that it is a unique opportunity to talk to such a service provider and ask her how she was able to implement it. So we have Natalia Karpuhina, a nurse uh, providing TB treatment in Odessa. Hello, Natalia. I would like to say thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so you can talk to us. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here and share our experience. Thank you for your unique risk experience. Uh, you were able to find the mental key uh, to allow patients uh, to follow their treatment regimens and uh, to uh, decrease uh, uh, the further transmission of the disease. What is the biggest challenge in such format of work with the patient? So, like in my head, I can imagine, but I would like to hear it from you. Well, a big challenge is that uh, such a project uh, was uh, very acceptable for uh, socially active, socially uh, adapted people. People who have smartphones, who have laptops, who are responsible and they want uh, to get treatment. And it is comfortable for them to take their medicines at home without the need to go to the clinic every day to take the medicines. Now, I would like to repeat again. So it works like this. We have a patient, we have a nurse. So the patient, when uh, taking medicines, makes videos with a smartphone and makes such video reports and sends every day to the nurse. Yes, every day they send such reports. So what is the incentive for you and for the patient? Maybe you can uh, talk about the specific uh, amounts uh, of incentives. Well, uh, as for the nurse, she doesn't receive uh, any financial bonuses, but uh, she can provide services to up to 50 people because uh, in the old format of work, she can uh, only work with 20 uh, patients if she has to go directly to everybody's home. So it is convenient for the nurse and for the patient because no transportation costs are uh, involved. And what is the bonus for the patient? Well, I want to say that video DOT uh, in this clinic was a continuation of the model which we mentioned before, uh, outpatient treatment by nurses. So uh, such that back then, uh, the nurses had uh, uh, incentives of about uh, 50 cents, and uh, there was an order of the mayor uh, saying that uh, and now a 15 grievances uh, or also about 50 cents will, will be paid to nurses from the city budget now. And uh, the patients, they received 300 uh, grivna. Uh, after the complete treatment. And now the social department will 
pay them 300 grivna to their banking card if they adhere to therapy and have no treatment interruptions. So do you think that uh, you could give any recommendations to the cities who would like to implement such a project? Because for me, as a person who tracks the level of trust uh, of uh, p uh, people uh, to uh, different agencies, I think that actually uh, financial motivation is always a good uh, tool, of course. Because now uh, municipalities of many cities, they watch what is uh, going on here. So what would you recommend how to start this work and what can be improved? based on your experience. First of all, there should be a program supported by municipal administration and which could be uh, funded. Because funding, it's an important, but not the only principle allowing to promote certain programs. It is also so very important to have trust-based relations between the health provider working with the patient and the patient. I think that we should remember about it and we should focus on it because the level of trust between the patient and the health provider it is vital and it is very difficult to achieve it and very easy to lose it. Natalia, so how do you build this trust-based relations? Because, you know, in our country, nurses uh, sometimes, you know, uh, are hard to build uh, trust relations with the patients. Well, in fact, we have minimum contact with the patients. They send us their videos. And at this point, so you have a kind of digital love, right? Well, kind of. The only thing is how to convince them to do it so that they choose this option, which is uh, most accept acceptable for them. Many people actually chose a video a DOT program, and for many patients, it is a very convenient uh, project, and it is effective. Yes, it is effective. Thanks a lot. So, dear friends, let's applaud to our participants. Well, video DOT uh, requires certain preparations. You cannot start it from the first day of tr treatment because before starting video DOT, there should be directly observed to treatment when uh, the doctor or the nurse uh, work face to face. And at that phase, uh, trust-based relations are formed. And then we can give medicines uh, to patients uh, for several days. And Natasha is just shy, but in fact, patients call her day and night. If they have a problem, not only related to tuberculosis or any other issues, they call her and want to talk to her. Okay, good. Thank you. That's a great initiative, and thanks for implementing it. So we had Oksana Leonika Bradetska, chief physician of the Odessa City uh, TB Treatment Clinic, and the nurse Natalia Karpuhina. And we move forward. It is estimated uh, that in the ECAR region there is 1.7 million people living with HIV, and only 7% of them uh, knew uh, about it uh, in 2018. That is why it is very important to help people to detect HIV as soon as possible so that they could start uh, the treatment. How do we do it? Uh, some people say that you need to test all the people. Well, first of all, it's going to be quite expensive and is that, that means it's a one-off thing. For example, one saliva test costs about one to three dollars and for the whole city or a country that's a fantastic amount. Can we do it in a more focused way to resolve the problem? Is there some strategy to detect uh, many new HIV cases but with smaller number of tests? There is also some very convincing statistics. According to the recent global report of UNAIDS, so 54% of all new HIV cases around the world are concerned representatives of the uh, key populations and their sexual partners, and this number is even higher, 95% of new HIV cases in uh, our region. So this is real. 
Uh, moreover, a saliva test is available outside the healthcare facilities in the countries of our region. The Alliance for Public Health has been working for a long time with such methods uh, to improve the detection of HIV and has been achieving some good results. Uh, more details about the case of Almaty will be delivered by Olga Denisuk, Programmatic Manager of the Alliance for Public Health. Okay, Olga, for you we have uh, this. Yeah, you, you have a microphone. Okay, great. But let me remind you about this control point. Does it work, Olga? Let's use our microphone because it, it's got this green ring uh, uh, fitting you really well. Uh, thank you very much for this good presentation, but I, you left me with nothing to, to say to people after all. Okay, we have just a few slides, so I will try to like speak from the personal experience. When we speak about uh, the personal, uh, the 30% the of people who are not aware of their HIV positive uh, status, I advise you to look at the particular numbers. That's 500,000 people. Actually, that's a population of um, not a small European city like uh, Copenhagen or Lisbon, half a million people again. And when we look at such a number of people, such a mass of people who could learn about the status, who could uh, receive the treatments in time and uh, prevent uh, development of some diseases in the future, we understand that something is wrong with our strategies. And despite the fact that we have had significant improvement in testing in the last uh, 15 years, we can do testing in the labs, we can do in the non-healthcare facilities. Let us tell people what index testing is. We will speak about that. We have a different understanding of the index testing, but the thing I'm going to describe right now is not uh, specifically index testing as uh, WHO means it, but we'll return to it. So despite the fact that we actually have all the tools necessary for people to come take tests, see the nurses, doctors, social workers, Something goes wrong, and for us to actually be able to understand what strategy would let us to reach to the people who don't use such services, for that we need to think about the nature of transmission of HIV infection. We know that it is passed only in case of a very close contact uh, through injections or through sex or uh, from mother to a child. So this way we can develop the strategies to reach uh, with tests uh, the people who don't uh, come to get our conventional interventions. So if you look at this model, at those green uh, circles at the top, those are standard approach uh, methods. When we go to a healthcare sector or some public sector and we test everyone, especially in the group uh, groups with high HIV prevalence, like uh, injection drug users, and we test them all and we detect one to three percent. So what does that mean? That's one two or three persons in a hundred. And we know that the prevalence of HIV among uh, people who inject drugs is more than 20 percent. So many people are not reached using this approach. This approach can be used and it should remain as, a, as an approach for prevention. But we need to we need to have testing that uh, detects more cases that actually exist. So based on this, we've developed a model allowing to find so-called seeds. And we can use uh, the HIV positive results uh, to identify people who 
produce a risky behavior and having this understanding of the path of transmission uh, of the disease, we want to invite sexual or injection partners of uh, the HIV positive people or we can uh, like invite just people at risk. Uh, so we uh, give uh, the HIV positive person an opportunity to decide who of uh, their uh, circle of communication should be tested. So this model uses some algorithms because uh, already knowing about the prevalence of the disease in some group, we understand that we don't want to test many people from one social network if we don't get positives there. Uh, so this model allows us to stop recruiting uh, those uh, partners at some stage, allowing us to uh, detect uh, most people while uh, testing this amount of people, this quantity of people. Uh, now wait a second. Yep. To ensure quality monitoring of this approach, we definitely want to avoid all sorts of forms of uh, paper documents because the checking who brought whom and who was positive, who was negative is very difficult. It's impossible if you speak about large volumes, about large numbers of people. And if you speak about Ukraine, we've tested uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And if we use paperwork, uh, we'll get more uh, errors with every single person who gets tested. So we've developed a mobile app allowing us to track uh, all those uh, uh, chains of uh, tested people and that's what uh, Andre mentioned. Uh, this uh, application uses mobile, uh, uses machine learning which allows us to stop at some point or maybe invite more people if we see that uh, through the algorithm that this particular client may have more positive partners in his uh, social risk network. So, of course, using the technology for quality monitoring and uh, timely modification or updating of the program is very important for us. And, of course, I'd like to speak about the treatment in this uh, area because our goal is not just to detect these people to improve the percentage, the rate of uh, detection, like we've reached those 20%. We do it to let people start uh, treatment as early as possible. So for that we use the case management approach and that works in uh, non-government sector. We involve the people in this work, the people who know what uh, harm reduction is, what uh, work with uh, injection drug users is, and we know that this uh, intervention called CITI, many of you have heard about that probably, that's a community initiated treatment intervention. That means that we uh, delegate uh, the task to link into care to the communities. So it's not a structured intervention and uh, each case manager will develop an individual client support plan uh, according to the needs of this client and uh, the goal is to help this person to, uh, to start treatment as soon as possible. So. Uh, returning to our 1% of standard approach uh, of uh, covering with testing, we totally support these approaches in the context of prof uh, prevention. They work really well, but then we want to use them, especially in the risk group, as, a, as the foothold, uh, as the basis uh, to look for those seeds uh, whom we then uh, can use to go deeper in the social risk sectors uh, and recruit the people who really need to get tested. And of course, uh, the people we uh, detect, we link them to care in the fastest terms. And in Ukraine, according to the recent data in the group of uh, people who inject drugs, 
at the percentage of linkage to care among the detected cases is 86 percent, which is uh, very good because this group is always hard to reach. It's very hard to link them to care, but that means that the implementation of the testing and linking to care uh, projects through NGOs providing uh, non-health care services too is very important. And We've implemented this approach in several cities, and I'd like to show you a video about the experience of our activities in the city of Almaty. And uh, today, I don't know whether those colleagues are present here. Yeah, that will, they they got a, a first antic team. Очевидно, что таким образом не удастся выявить всех нуждающихся в лечении людей. Эфи и Казахстан изменили подход коренным образом и улучшили ситуацию с выявляемостью ВИЧ в городе. В 2018 году в Казахстане были внедрены ключевые инновации. Во-первых, были впервые использованы экспресс-тесты по свине в аутрич условиях. So testing uh, has in the field uh, has a, made uh, the testing more accessible. Вначале аутрич работники протестировали своих знакомых клиентов. Потом обращались к тем из них, у кого был выявлен позитивный вич статус, чтобы они предложили направить трех человек из своего близкого окружения, с которыми они практиковали рискованное поведение в контексте ВИЧ, для прохождения теста. Для мотивации клиентам выдавались специальные купоны из QR. That's really impressive. Thanks a lot for what you are doing. I think it will be useful for us. So, Olga, could you sum it up? Yeah, sure. If we want to improve uh, the detection of HIV, especially in key populations, we uh, don't need a lot, in fact. We need to go outside uh, uh, clinics, and we need uh, to give uh, an opportunity to get people tested for HIV uh, to non-health professionals, those who work directly with key populations. We need to go deeper into the risk networks. We have tools for that. And of course, we need to involve the NGOs working in a HIV uh, prevention uh, and uh, harm reduction, uh, because that's the bridge which was missing between the patients uh, and the healthcare institutions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, Olga Denisuk, Program Manager, Alliance for Public Health. And your applause. Thank you, Olga. 
And I would add uh, that in the ECA region, uh, there is about 1.7 of people living with HIV, and only 70% of them knew the, their status in 2018. That's for you to understand how important it is. And London is the first city in the world which achieved uh, the indicators 95, 98, 97 uh, in terms of HIV cascade. So they detected 95 uh, of uh, the estimated number of HIV cases, and 98% uh, of uh, them received the ART. So in the world, there is one intervention now which allows preventing in new cases of HIV uh, if risks are available. This is pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis of HIV or PrEP. What is it? It is just uh, a pill uh, for HIV treatment. And uh, it is uh, like uh, a treatment from malaria, which you uh, take before uh, going on vacation uh, where there is a possibility uh, to get a malaria or a vaccination that you do uh, before uh, your um, vacation. Uh, so PrEP works in the same way. So a person knowing his or her risk starts uh, taking uh, uh, prevention drugs before the process and as a result people stay healthy HIV is not transmitted and uh, there is a number of studies which prove it so uh, first uh, uh, several discordant uh, couples were uh, recommended to take such uh, medicines where one of uh, the partners already has HIV or to people who practice, practice risky behaviors such as casual sexual contacts or to people who do not have a regular sexual partner in the ECA region, only in Ukraine, Georgia, Russia, and Moldova. There are PrEP programs, though in the world uh, they are widely accessible, especially in the LGBT community uh, and uh, among sex workers. Today, today uh, in our room, we have a colleague from uh, Kishinev, uh, where a PrEP uh, uh, program just uh, was launched recently. So please come to us and tell us more about this wonderful program. So we have Yevgeny Galashapov, Director of Advocacy Department of uh, the Positive Initiative NGO. Hey, hello, Yevgeny. So you were kind of nervous uh, that I will uh, tell your name correctly. So was I right? Yeah, you did everything well. So did I explain it well about PrEP? Is it uh, the PrEP pills? Yeah, so yes, they are. So were my words correct uh, about the principles of PrEP? Could you maybe uh, talk more about this uh, program and uh, how actually you were able to implement it in your country? Because I know that there are some uh, mental uh, peculiarities uh, of uh, uh, the region. Uh, so you can read uh, there, uh, uh, the information there. Maybe I should take it. No, no, it, it won't m make uh, sense because you need to take it regularly. You actually did a very good introduction into PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis of HIV, so it doesn't have any smell. No, it doesn't. Oh, it's a pity. It's a pity. So you would like to, it to have smell. Okay. So you can compare uh, PrEP uh, not uh, with the vaccination, because you make vaccination just once, uh, and then for you forget about the disease. But uh, with birth control pills that, um, you know, women take, for example, that's something similar. Because here you need to be disciplined, you need to do it regularly, you need to do it every day. And so a woman knows that if she takes uh, those pills, uh, the risk of unwanted pregnancy is uh, goes down to almost zero. So we can say the same about PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis, so it works the same way. So if a person who has uh, risks of exposure to HIV takes those pills uh, every day or based on the needs, because there are different regimens, the risk of uh, uh, contracting HIV is almost zero. So here we need discipline, motivation, and a desire to stay healthy. Do you take PrEP? Yes. I, uh, I I will uh, tell uh, uh, why. Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, first uh, of all uh, is that I coordinate the implementation of PrEP in Moldova from the side of our NGO uh, Positive Initiative. So it is one of the reasons, but probably not the most important one. 
I had a kind of a funny uh, situation when I uh, got acquainted with the girl and it was wonderful, but uh, at one uh, time the condom was broken. So we agreed with her that we'll go and get tested just in case I was sure that my results will come back uh, a negative and I thought that for her it could be a kind of a good signal that I'm open to and that I care about safety and if we, you know, um, see something then we can get treatment. So she said yes in the beginning but then she disappeared. And then later she told me that she was HIV positive. And she told it uh, on day four after it happened. So for it was uh, too late for post-exposure prophylaxis. So I had, uh, you know, an interesting period of my life in the next three weeks uh, uh, before I could actually understand if I got HIV or not. So for the first two, we two weeks, uh, I was getting prepared for me. And then I thought, hey, but let it be what it happens. I have a lot of people with HIV I know. Well, uh, what happens, happens. So then I got tested. Uh, HIV was not detected. Uh, so it was okay, but uh, she told me later that she actually was on air team. So her uh, uh, viral suppression was rather high uh, and uh, the transmission was possible, but probably there was some uh, level of viral suppression already. But what I thought is you never know uh, what is going to happen to you because you think that such things won't happen to you definitely but when I had such situation in my life I decided that I shouldn't you know play with uh, my life uh, and uh, it happened actually this year in spring when we started implementing PrEP and I decided that I should uh, take PrEP pills for me uh, as long as I don't have a regular partner so it's better for me to take those pills uh, for a, a certain period of time while I might have some uh, casual contacts uh, it, it is better than getting HIV and then having to take pills till the end of my life. So it's better to prevent than to treat also. What is inside those pills? What's the content? Here we have, it's a generic drug, emtricitabine and tenafavir. So that's the classical regime. Okay, I'll pretend that I understand what you're talking about. Well, I'm not a doctor also, I'm a lawyer, so I won't give you very detailed information. So do they protect only from HIV but also or, or also other diseases? Now that's only for HIV prevention. There are certain limitations. Uh, and if uh, people has um, problems with the, the a kidney uh, function, uh, you have every t uh, three months to uh, go uh, through a creatinine test uh, and uh, two or three percent of people can uh, have negative response to such uh, uh, pills. In this case, you either have uh, to somehow uh, take additional drugs for your kidney function or you need to say no to PrEP. But the percentage of people with contraindications is pretty low, actually. And also, the level of uh, calcium in your bones can go down, but after you uh, stop a uh, PrEP, uh, then uh, uh, it, it goes to back to normal. Uh, how often do you need to take them? Well, every day. Every day? Well, in Moldova, we have uh, only one uh, regimen, so daily PrEP. At the same time, uh, so you can do it in the morning, in the evening. You can have some signal on your smartphone that will uh, remind you uh, that you need to take a pill. And another option, uh, which was uh, is applied in the world uh, and was uh, approved by the WHO, is event-driven PrEP. When a person can have uh, um, irregular, like uh, rather rare sexual contacts uh, also, or risky contacts, uh, so maybe once a month, uh, then uh, the person has to take two pills. Uh, like 2 to 24 uh, hours before the sexual contact and then two pills after the sexual contact. So it is uh, event-driven, so people take it on demand. So I have two questions then. Where can people buy those pills? And uh, uh, I think that uh, 
there should be a license for this uh, medicines? Or is it possible only like so that we can buy uh, the such medicines here? Or is it only available in your country? You know, not in, only in our country, like in Ukraine, uh, Alliance for Public Health uh, uh, promotes uh, PrEP, but only it can be uh, received from Alliance. It's not possible to buy uh, the medicines. Well, I know that in some countries people can buy uh, such medicines, but in Moldova, the government procures PrEP uh, medicines uh, and such medicines are provided free of charge to uh, people who have uh, risks of HIV exposure, uh, for example, for a discordant couple when one partner has HIV uh, and also for uh, a man who have uh, sex with men or sex workers or any HIV a uh, negative uh, person who ha doesn't have regular uh, relations and uh, different situations can happen, as I know from my experience. Uh, so uh, in our country, uh, in hospitals, uh, uh, people can access PrEP uh, from the same doctors who uh, give uh, ART to patients, also they give uh, PrEP. And also we try to do more patient-friendly uh, option uh, so uh, for NGOs to be able to give uh, out uh, uh, prep because some people they don't want to go to aid centers they don't want someone to think that they have HIV because they go there so uh, the other option is to go to several NGOs uh, who cooperate with infectious disease uh, doctors uh, they come to NGOs at certain days uh, and see patients there uh, so there are a couple of options there and another thing that I wanted to say I have many guys that I know and uh, they uh, live uh, with HIV with open faces. And so I thought uh, that in Moldova there should be some people who take PrEP openly. So now I'm the first person from my country who openly said that I take PrEP. And I want to set an, an example for others. Thank you for being open and for being a missionary because I think that setting an example to other people and it can be a question of life and death sometimes. That's very important. Thanks a lot. So Evgeny Galashapov, Director of Advocacy Department of uh, a Positive Initiative NGO. And we go on. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, now I'll have a speaker I waited for for quite a long time because I heard a lot about this brave lady and I really want to talk to her face to face and I want to talk about that. Yes, I think that you already know who I'm talking about. Uh, so we'll talk about life hacks from the city council, how to implement HIV TB programs and uh, in uh, several uh, moments we'll have Irina Kutsenka here. She's a deputy of Odessa City Council. So please give her some applause. So Irina is coming and uh, we really hope that a simple methodologies and cases will be implemented in your countries, in uh, ECA cities. We need to curb the HIV epidemic in the nearest future to somehow localize and eliminate the epidemic. And I'm sure that municipal authorities, they can reverse the situation. And here we have a very positive example. So hello, Rina, I'm happy to see you. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. And I've, we've heard a lot about what you do in Odessa. I know that in Odessa, uh, you uh, achieved unprecedented successes in the response to HIV and tuberculosis. So Mr. Trukhanov was telling uh, about it uh, in the morning. So could you share your experience with other cities of the ECA region? Uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. You know, the formula of success is the following. You need to have a good team, which shouldn't be egocentric. So it shouldn't be focused on some political party or uh, only a mayor or only uh, medical professionals or health department. It is important in this team to have uh, different uh, members. So it should be a multi uh, stakeholder. So what happened in Odessa? We had some people from civil society organizations, uh, from the health department. Uh, so from the 
at the mayor's team, we all decided that we need to change the situation in Odessa. It all started in quite an interesting way because we received a letter to the uh, Odessa City Council from Alliance for Public Health uh, with an invitation to take part in Harm Reduction Academy. So they asked to send a public official. Uh, somehow I was lucky or unlucky, I don't know. But I, well, uh, mayor called me and uh, told me, okay, Irina, you deal with social uh, issues, uh, go and learn. So it was a uh, harm reduction academy consisting of three sessions, one in Kiev, one in Dubai, one in Delhi, and one in Mombasa. So I went to Kiev for the first time, and uh, when people started to, to learn about each other, and they, I looked at those people, they are nice, beautiful people, they are very representatives of the uh, key populations, I used to call them in a different way, let me... I called, uh, yeah, really, I called to, Oleg, uh, to, to the mayor and to, to told him, what did you send me? Here we have prostitutes and uh, drug addicts, and I need to learn something from them. And he told me, okay, go on, learn. And that was it. Okay, so let me tell you this. Don't do this. It's very bad to, to do these things for politicians. They often use a lot of uh, abbreviations that are not uh, easy to understand. Like, I go there, I know English, but I don't understand a single word they say. A lot of acronyms, and thanks to Marina Braga, she's from Odessa, and now she is from uh, the, the Alliance for Public Health, and she told me about uh, all these things, and then I started understanding what was going on. Actually, I was, I felt totally against that because in ideas I was against implementation of the substitution maintenance therapy and I actually once closed the SMT site and I collected uh, uh, signs against the LGBT community. I was an activist against that and I thought that I was right. But thanks to Jacob Huber, he, is our, he was our teacher at the academy, uh, I totally ch changed my mind, uh, and every session I came there and I uh, raised the right, asking why, do you understand that we are sponsoring the, the drug use, uh, do you think, understand that we are supporting the propaganda of drugs, uh, it was against the Christian morale, I thought so, and thank you, Jacob, for taking my hand and taking me to a dinner and having this long conversation with me. Then. I understand that the things he, that he had to explain, like you say you are a Christian and you want to save people, but I will prove that I'm, I'm more of a Christian because while you are speaking good things to people or give them choice, I give them choice not to die in the abstinence. I give them a chance to live longer because they consume drugs in clean environment. So who's a better Christian, me or you? And then I went home in Mombasa, cried a lot, and, and I understood that I was doing something wrong. When I returned back to my city, I told uh, to the mayor, okay, everything I knew totally changed my mind, and I believe I need time to understand what to do with it. Give me some time, please. Then. I'm really thankful to Vitaly Novosvitny and uh, Yelena Gribova, who, who is also here. I hope uh, these are people who started to tell me step by step what it is, why HIV is important. For the first time, I heard that you can take ART and stop being dangerous for the society. For me, that was a revolution. It was a discovery, and I'd like to say, say thanks to Vlad Strik, who told me that, like Irina, you understand that LGBT people are also people. They're humans, and they need to live, and uh, they have their rights, and uh, they need to be 
respected. So I changed. I came to the mayor. I prepared the report and I provided the real statistics. So the first thing we did, we learned about the real statistic existing in Odessa. And when the mayor learned about what we had in the city, about the real situation, he said, but that's so many people. Yeah. And you understand that when every seventh of them is HIV positive, and they are in the general mass of people, and uh, they have uh, sexual transmission into this open society in, in the use. Yeah, they are open. And I'd like to s thank our mayor who said we must stop it. What do you do for that? We have only three minutes left, uh, so could you please tell us what you were able to do, share with other cities your experience, what you were able to do. Yeah, we adopted a city program to uh, fight HIV, tuberculosis, hepatitis, and drug use. We understood that we may stop it only by working in these four directions. So, so we allocated some funds from the city budget, we implemented uh, testing for the people, we increased uh, the number of the uh, trust offices, and we have opened a new uh, OST site, and we are planning to open two more. We provide funds for uh, harm reduction, for social support, for prevention. We've implemented new methods for tuberculosis, and I must say that we have a beautiful, well-aligned team, and it's just the beginning. Him. We uh, have a very ambitious mayor, even though he was very modest in the morning. I am sure we are going to make it, and we are totally open to everyone. We uh, are looking forward to seeing you in Odessa, and we will disclose all the little tricks we learned, and we are ready to go elsewhere to learn from other people and the international experience helps us to find new and better practices. We have a minute and a half, maybe some figures. It's important to see the difference be, 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 like what it was before and what it is now. How much the situation has changed? Yeah, you understand I'm not a doctor, I'm a politician, and when you start uh, asking me about numbers, I tell you this. We have increased the number of people linked to care to 86%, right? 86%, and it was? And it was like 43%. So I understand that this increase, that's two and a half years. And I will tell to the politicians, our community members here, we had the 43 hearings on this program. The council members did not want to adopt it. It took 43 hearings and consultations, and the third time they voted for it. So they were laughing like, let those donors spend their money, we don't need to allocate the budget funds. But now every council member tries to say, oh, we have adopted an HIV program, we are good guys. Yes, you, you did adopt it, but when I talked to you, you told me, don't do it. But now you see they were mistaken. Now, thank you, Irina Kutsenko, member of the City Council of Odessa. You've heard about the Odessa case now. Uh, but now we are going to have a coffee break to have a rest and think about what we've heard. Thank you for being with us, dear friends. Please come back at... Uh, 4 p.m. sharp.
So hello again, everyone. Uh, those who still uh, the coffee break and hear me, please come inside because we are continuing our f forum, and uh, it's going to be very interesting now. I must say that all these things, all these foundations, people, they don't work for statistics sake, they work to preserve people's lives. And today's uh, meeting would not be uh, successful without the real success stories, without good examples of what you can achieve. Uh, to change the lives of the people in the new environment. Yeah, I was a little bit um, disappointed because, uh, you know, this, uh, I was sad rather, yes, uh, this uh, very successful stories will be delivered uh, by a different moderator, not by me, but then I checked who this person was that was going to be the moderator for this panel. I am I totally trust this person, and so welcome Kevin Osborne from the International AIDS Society. Please give him a round of applause. And Kevin now will say his uh, welcome word, and then I uh, would like uh, you to note that the next speakers will be Yulia Georgiev, human, human rights activist from Sofia, Bulgaria. Yulia, you are the support team I see, uh, so please take your seat. And Marie Gahu Kids, uh, uh, Organization of Women of Freedom, uh, Tbilisi, Gruzia. Uh, thank you for coming with us, uh, Angelika Okonska, Belarus. E Amir. And Amir Shekizhanov, LGBT activist and coordinator of Space Almaty Kazakhstan community. So I'm leaving you to this new moderator team and have a nice dialogue. It's the last session of the day and as you can hear from my accent, I'm not from the region. But I often wondered why I was called to do this, this moderation. And I think there's maybe two folds for it. One, I'm from South Africa. And South Africa has one of the highest rates of HIV and TB in the world. So when Luchika spoke earlier today about trying to say we need to make sure that these two diseases speak in closer unison, maybe that's part of it. That's maybe one part why I'm here. And maybe the second part why I'm here is just like everybody on the stage today that we're going to hear from, we are about communities. And there's one thing that I think you're going to have heard over the last, the whole day today, is that all of these interventions, that all the mayors need to do, that all the policies need to do, that all the services need to do, they're all targeted at a group of people. And in this region, they're primarily targeted or trying to reach so-called hard-to-reach populations, which are key populations. And I'm so pleased to be on the stage today with representatives of the four key populations, so thank you. And before we start, there's a great video that I'd like you to watch, so let's all watch this video right now. The number one barrier for gay men and other MSM to fully enjoy well-being and health is stigma. 30 years after homosexuality was depathologized by the World Health Organization, the majority of population in the region still uses something shameful or sick. The routine evil is that people deny help, excluding themselves from social life. They infect each other, being cut off from the world and left without information and support. While talking about HIV and transgender, we have to mention that existing data indicate, according to the result of a systematic review and meta-analyzing, the combined HIV prevalence among transgender is 90% in countries with laboratory-confirmed data. The Global Fund reduces funding in our region. 
The funding is transited to governmental programs. We call to look at funding allocated to meet needs of different marginalized groups, including that sex workers, people who use drugs, and other groups could work together. People who use drugs are perceived by society basically as criminals. They hide even while being in deadly danger. According to different estimates, there are communities in the region where up to 80% of female prisoners are convicted for drug-associated crimes. A series of EKHN studies indicate that there are many indirect health problems for transgender, including high level of violence and harassment, substance abuse, sexual coercion, sexual abuse, depression with suicidal thoughts and attempts. Our demands are clear. Decriminalize same-sex relations in Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Russia. Ensure protection of rights and freedoms for LGBT people and adopt anti-discrimination laws. Fully fund evidence-based HIV services for gay men and other MSM. World Health Organization, amongst other things, advocates for the reduction of stigma and discrimination against different groups. Let's stop the epidemic together. It is in your power. And so I'm sure you've seen from this video, while we're going to all represent different kinds of key populations, the one thing is that there's a lot of intersectionality. So while we talk about men who have sex with men, or people who inject drugs, those can often coincide in one person. So I think this intersectionality of who we are, whether we're HIV positive or negative, what kind of behaviors we do or what work we do, and, and how we fit in society is absolutely key. And the one thing we know is that evidence-based and evidence-informed policies go a long way to start that. So I'm going to start at the top. Um, Yulia, um, Yulia, you're from Bulgaria, and you're co-chair of the steering committee of the Eurasia Harm Reduction Association. Tell me in two minutes a little bit about your work. Oh, my work. Hello. One, two, three. Okay, yeah. can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Uh, so about my work, it's a little bit complicated in Bulgaria. You know, but unfortunately, Bulgaria is the worst example after global uh, fund withdrawal from the region. Uh, finally, and luckily, finally, we have uh, some kind of harm reduction of syringe exchange on the streets already uh, for a few months. Uh, in the same time, we had a chance to open uh, one drop-in center in Sofia to reopen it. Uh, and at the moment, we are trying to survive it by uh, crowdfunding. This is a donation from individuals, uh, which is uh, absolutely crazy. Uh, on the same time, I'm trying to work with... Uh, uh, drug policy on international level because, uh, of course, the knowledge is everywhere and uh, we definitely need to uh, try to implement the good practices everywhere. Uh, in the same time, yes, I used to uh, do drugs. It was a very long time ago. Uh, but uh, I definitely believe that the people have a different ways uh, to deal with drugs. Uh, and if my way is just to, to stop doing it because that's me and this is my way, uh, I'm a little bit envy to the people who can take time to time, to be honest. Uh, I absolutely believe that the first thing we need to think about uh, is uh, connected to the way how we are looking to those people, to all people from the communities. Uh, all the day we are talking about how to help them. But I think that the real question is how they can help us as an expert. Uh, because the people from the communities uh, has a huge power, they ha has a huge knowledge, uh, and a huge potential uh, to give to the experts knowledge how what happens in the communities and how they can uh, deal with it. So this is the, the top of me. Thanks. Thanks a lot, and I think you've touched on very clearly that the expertise is sitting on this room with communities. So Tamari from Georgia, I don't think you need lots of introduction, because for those of you who don't know, Tamari is like the front face in Georgia on billboards, on World AIDS Day campaigns. Everybody knows around her work, especially around sex work. So can you tell us a little bit about your work in the sex work community specifically? 
Я приветствую всех. I oh, welcome. Are you all? I represent uh, Self Organization of Women for Freedom. Uh, this was the first self organization in Georgia working with the sex workers and with the uh, ex uh, prisoners uh, uh, and uh, women living with the HIV. Our uh, organization is uh, a member of SWAN. Uh, we we work uh, with the, uh, all the women who have uh, some problems, and they feel uh, they feel that they face the stigma, discrimination, they face violation of their rights. Uh, so we gather those cases and we try to help to bring those cases in courts. Um, Angelica from Belarus. Uh, Angelica is uh, uh, Belarus. The CCM in Belarus. So welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in Belarus and, and, the, and the work you do? Uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I uh, represent transgender co community in CCM, uh, and the fact that I became member of CCM, and the fact that transgender people became uh, visible uh, for the key decision makers. Um, forming the policies uh, in uh, HIV response. So the very fact that I, uh, we became visible is important. Uh, and the, so it is a justification to see this population as vulnerable, not only socially vulnerable, but also epidemiologically vulnerable. So something like this. And um, in fact, the community of transgender uh, uh, people, um, uh, we need to continue studying uh, this uh, community uh, because to understand some problem and to help people, we need to understand uh, uh, what we do, who we are. So very often, uh, when we talk uh, to some government officials. Uh, the government officials do not understand why transgender people need HIV prevention. So they think that we just need uh, gender recognition and why should we talk about some prevention. And uh, uh, the fact that before uh, gender reassignment, to many uh, transgender people are engaged in sex work, they actually have to do it. And the fact that uh, the biology of many men means that uh, men want uh, to have some experiments, uh, and if they see a trans woman, they want to do all kind of things with her. We want to talk about those things on a regular basis. And I think that Belarus uh, it, it thinks a lot, but when some decisions are made, those uh, decisions are uh, made uh, in a very reasonable and justified way. So in our country was one of the first uh, to allow change of gender marker and uh, our passport gender. So we have understanding of this need. But in the context of prevention, I think that we still do not have, how can I explain it? We do not have a, a good understanding here. I think from the video as well, we've shown the increased vulnerability of transgender people in particular to HIV, so thank you. Amir from Kazakhstan, I know you manage one of the, one of the last remaining centers for LGBTI. Tell us a little bit about your work. And Hello, everyone. My name is Amir. I am really responsible for the community center for LGBT in Almaty, and it uh, actually was uh, possible through the F cities project. So first, we met every week. So uh, we. 
it was uh, homosexual and bisexual, uh, gay men and uh, other men who have sent sex with men. So we've been doing, uh, having this uh, uh, community center for a year already. Also, we tr I tried to improve the visibility of LGBT community in the internet uh, and uh, so online and offline. We created an uh, online platform. Uh, Team and uh, it is important for me to be visible, to be loud, and to show that we exist. We have our problems as a community because one of the biggest uh, challenges in terms of advocacy and changing attitudes to LGBT community is that we are invisible. And if we are invisible, our problems are invisible. They seem insignificant. So it's important to talk about it. And apart from the community center uh, and uh, taking part in the SCOP team uh, project, uh, also I work on improving visibility of, of LGBT. But my main work is HIV prevention. Uh, so we uh, distribute uh, self-testing uh, sets uh, for uh, MSM and trans people. Thank you. Uh, today, we've got a wealth of experience. And the one thing I want to try and dig out from all of you is we hear through the videos, through what you said today, that stigma and discrimination still seem to be the recurring theme that we always need to deal with, the Achilles heel. So tell me a little bit about what, what should we be doing in real terms. If, if in a year's time, we were all back on the stage, and I said to you, what's the one thing that we can make a difference around stigma and discrimination, around the communities you represent? What, I know it's a difficult question. What would it be? So let me start with you, Yulia. What would it be? Okay, I don't have a recipe, of course. If we have had a recipe, the wife will be much, much beautiful. Uh, but I definitely believe that the people from the community need uh, to go outside of the closet. It's the same, absolutely. Uh, and the people from the community needs to show their expertise and uh, to start to deal with the problem of the society, of the whole society. Uh, because, of course, we, every, in, every, in every community there is different problems and the people, it's absolutely normal for people to, to scare the, of the behavior of the others. I mean, we, has, uh, we have a huge discrimination in Bulgaria. We uh, did a report, a research and report about the, the levels of discrimination in uh, my country. And uh, when we are talking about people who are injecting drugs, the discrimination on, is on extremely, extremely high levels. Uh, I mean, uh, regarding the police uh, or even regarding of the medical staff, the people who inject drugs uh, reported that uh, they have about 90, 95%. Uh, so at the beginning, I believe that, that we need to tell to everybody, yes, I'm a drug user, I'm an ex-drug user, uh, and I'm working in that field, and uh, I absolutely believe in the potential of the people from my community, uh, and I absolutely know that those people can make, make, make change, change for the whole society, and they can improve it very, very well. Uh, in the same time, I also believe that we need uh, to start speaking uh, in a very positive way about, uh, about our, our people, about, uh, about our friends. Uh, because all the time in my country, especially, we are speaking about the poor guys, the poor they, 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 they are not able. No, it is not true. The people are able and the people uh, are very, very strong. I'm very honored that at the moment uh, in Bulgaria, um, is registered uh, the first uh, people who use, the, use drugs uh, organization for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud of the people uh, who started to do it. We, we, we did it together, but it is absolutely amazing. So I really believe that they can make the change. Cool. Amir, you spoke earlier about being out and being visible. So how would you agree? Would you agree with what's been said about how we tackle discrimination and stigma specifically for MSM? Well, I think, yes, uh, the community needs it, uh, first of all. For the MSM people, for the LGBT community, because the stigma against LGBT people in general is very similar to the one against women, for example. 
And in this context, uh, there is a big difference uh, for, for stigma of sex workers and people who inject drugs because uh, you are born as an LGBT or a woman and you st start hearing terrible things about yourself from the childhood and they determine your level in the society, your value for the people, your fate if you want. And based on that, it is very difficult to work, for example, with the MSM group or transgender people because in addition to the stigma about HIV and risks, uh, the, there is a stigma about, like me, being uh, valuable enough to be cared for. Uh, can I care for myself? Can I consider myself a person who is worth it to be uh, treated uh, by a healthcare professional? So. Because of this, I think one of the first important points is to improve the positive visibility. Like when he, pe people say, okay, I'm gay and I'm happy, I'm, not, I'm fine, or I'm a lesbian, I'm active, I can achieve success in my life, or I'm a transgender woman and no one can stop me in this life but me. And those are positive examples that would strengthen the community. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are focused on the community center, for example, on the safe uh, space where people can learn to be themselves. It is actually difficult because all your life you hear that you are wrong and uh, all of a sudden you are among the people who are just like you and they are happy and want to be happy, they support each other. I think that's a very important point. And there is another moment about the stigma. I think that uh, public officials must also uh, contribute to fighting stigma. They need to learn to see all the people needing services as equal humans. And uh, every word here is important. We are equal in our right to have rights and we are humans, not just lines in your budget or in your register. We are people who need to be treated as humans. So that services, uh, service people look at me as a person equal to a president or a minister or a homeless person, whatever. Angelica, would you agree, like the self-worth, how do we build self-worth and confidence and visibility in, in our communities? You see, I believe that here you can should not uh, confuse visibility and propaganda because very often this visibility is uh, like at the snap of the finger is substituted with propaganda. And people start thinking like I'm propagating something like I'm a transgender woman or someone is gay or a sex worker or whatever. You need to have this understanding and measure in delivering it. You need to look for some ways to do it. I disagree. First, I don't know what propaganda is because I cannot pr propagate uh, homosexuality because uh, all, otherwise all people in this room would uh, become homosexuals at once if it worked. On the other hand, I think that such uh, ideas is an example of how careful uh, our uh, brains were washed with all those political uh, speeches about uh, telling that something in our nature is wrong. And it's not about LGBT. But now, for example, Russia is the biggest in information influencer. And they now support this uh, orthodoxal uh, Christian views. And we are the first uh, victims. But that's about any marginalized group. It's like we are not... Uh, worthy this uh, say equal attitude you are not worse but you are not the same that's the position at the moment and the idea that it is propaganda with all my due respect i disagree with angelica because propaganda must be there it must be everywhere in every tv set in every radio set and uh, this uh, should promote the position that we need to be able to live together uh, despite uh, the fact that we are different. And that's the propaganda we need, because without it, uh, we will only move to Abyss. It's fun. Angelica, let's go. Uh, I still disagree, because when I joined the CCCM and I was looked at at some freak 
But then they got used to me and started understanding that I'm a usual person and like I, I'm in some transition and I'm a woman. And this, uh, I think we we need to do it uh, drop by drop and not just uh, pouring the whole bucket of it over you. So when you like uh, approach it uh, so so frankly, that's like a little bit of shock. But if you add it bit by bit, you show that you are an adequate personality, then you can get some fruit from that. Because when it's shock, I, I'm saying like this, it's not like... Uh, it's not democratic, so to say. But visibility and, and, and giving support and, and vo vocalness to issues around sex work or communities. I'm the first woman in Georgia who disclosed my status. I'm HIV positive and I'm, I was infected in a prison. And when uh, they uh, gave me the positive test result, I thought at once that if I am not protected, then the others 880 women will not be protected as well. So I decided to disclose my status at once, and I told that I'm HIV positive, and then after the uh, release from the jail I wanted to take part in all the events just to, to help women living with HIV in Georgia to help protect it and the, it was better for them because employers do not employ us because we are HIV positive because like you know that's just how they want it to be. And even though it's a discrimination and discrimination against uh, the law, and it's punishable, actually, but they still do it. And I want to be an example for women who sit at home quietly, silently, and And they don't even tell about this to their children or husbands uh, and trying to hide it. I want to be an example for them. Mm -hmm. Julia? Uh, situation in different communities uh, are absolutely different. And uh, I definitely can understand Angelica uh, with, uh, with her attitude. Uh, but uh, still my mind, <laughs> uh, mind pet is to empower people from my community uh, to try to take their, their chances and to be a good examples for the, the, all the others. Uh, because I pers personally know a lot of people, hundreds of people who are using drugs time to time or every day, uh, and they are amazing professionals, they are amazing experts, uh, they are um, rolling models. Uh, and because of the discrimination in my country, they are staying hidden uh, from that, but their part of their, of their life. Uh, and I absolutely believe that it is very important to start to speak about the successful cases, about uh, the thing that uh, we are the same people as you. Uh, and uh, it's very funny, two, days, two or three days ago, uh, the deputy minister of health in Bulgaria said uh, in one interview uh, that uh, the exit of the heroin usage is death or prison. And I am absolutely disagree with it. <laughs> and uh, I believe that we need to, to stop that mythology uh, regarding drug usage. A lot of today has been about what the mayors have done, and they've signed declarations, and it's very much at a municipal level. Let's just say you were the mayors of the cities that you all come from. What's the one thing as mayor you would do? So what's the one difference, or what, what one advice would you give to your mayor? If your mayor was sitting next to you today, what one piece of advice from a community side would you say, hey, let's definitely do this? Amir. As I've said, it's important 
And I think it's quite easy to lose this in the context of uh, like management. At some point, people stop being humans for you. It's just a list of taxpayers, list of your staff, lines. And uh, then it is important to always remember that all uh, public servants, I don't just want to be uh, insulting, I mean, no offense, but they're very privileged uh, uh, service people. They have an honorable mission to make their lives of uh, people around them better. And it's very important that they think about the convenience and the needs of all these groups, of all the citizens, and they need to be flexible in their approach. And so it's important to have this political will when the public officials see all people from all groups are people who are equal to these public officials. So you see the human not aligned, you see an equal human, and only then you can achieve some achievements, because without this political will there will be only formality, and we have too many formalities. According to constitution, discrimination is forbidden, but there is not a single law describing what discrimination is. And no one uh, pro uh, prosecutes a politologist who said that he was going to, he wanted to castrate all the LGBT people. And that's uh, just fascism, come on, but no one responded to that. But if there was political will, and for example, in Almaty, we see in some institutes that it happens when this uh, cycle uh, of uh, patient-centeredness starts, uh, then all the results are achievable. You give if, you were, if you were mayor, what would you, what would you do? If we take the context of uh, HIV prevention and uh, we speak about it in general, I would advise a mayor to communicate with the Ministry of Information and somehow promote prevention, because prevention is always relevant. And for some reason, not on some uh, uh, dating sites, there is no information about uh, this, like, have prep like or use prevention they don't think like it's it looks like uh, people are interested in not having prevention so i would speak about better communication and awareness raising about prevention information i agree what would you do if you what would your advice be tamari to your mayor if you were if you were, if your mayor was sitting next to you today what advice would you give him or her Yeah. Unfortunately, our mayor was not able to come with us. I would really like to the mayor uh, to cooperate with us, with the community. That would be really so good. At least uh, him being uh, ready to listen to us sometimes to hear what we want and how we want. But I don't know why he cannot do it. I would really want him to s actually sit near us right now with all those mayors where they sat on this scene. Thank you. Yulia, what would your advice be? Uh, to be honest, if. The first thing I think that I need to do is to put responsibility for all those issues regarding uh, the needs of our communities to the people from the communities. Uh, there are a lot of experts, there are a lot of people who are very, uh, very near to the community and who can understand very easy uh, what the needs are, what the, the, how we can resolve uh, the problems, uh, and also how to stop discrimination. You've all, you've all spoken about the importance of healthcare providers and being the front face, whether around prevention or treatment, the role that healthcare providers play in all of our lives. So can you give me a positive example that you've experienced where you've gone to a healthcare provider and this person, be it a nurse or a receptionist or a doctor, and they've just done an amazing job. So we've all spoken about discrimination and the negatives. So just something, is there a positive thing that you've heard about or in your experience where a healthcare provider, whoever that person is, has just done something 
may be pretty normal, but in the context of discrimination was pretty good. Who wants to start? You'll start on that side. Julia, anything? Healthcare yeah. provider, yeah. Uh, Okay, my, my personal story is uh, then uh, during the time when I uh, the, doing drugs, I used to inject uh, heroin all the time, uh, and I met uh, that guys from the Initiative for Health Foundation, the first uh, harm reduction organization in, uh, in Bulgaria, uh, and they were so supportive and uh, they believed me so hard uh, that at, at, the, at the beginning uh, I became their, their gatekeeper. They started to give me a lot of syringes uh, which I shared to my, uh, to, to, to my friends. Uh, and a few years after that, after I stopped drugs and I, I've tried to work in uh, some kind of uh, drug-free therapeutic community, blah, blah. Uh, after that, they invited me to work for them. Uh, and it was how my career started. Tamari. What, any, any tips from your healthcare provider that were really great for you, that made your life a difference in your life? Well, just no. Well, I don't know. I think that the uh, first impact was when uh, I I was uh, a victim of domestic violence and I was put in a jail. So after four years uh, of, uh, uh, how shall I put it? After four years of imprisonment, I was diagnosed with the HIV. So it changed uh, my life completely. And I wanted and I still want uh, to uh, give my life to people who st hope, who still have a hope uh, to meet someone who will tell them that uh, this diagnosis is not uh, uh, a verdict. So I give them an example uh, sh and show that uh, women who want to give birth uh, to babies, I tell that after I was diagnosed with HIV, I gave uh, birth to two babies. Uh, one uh, of them was born uh, through a cesarean uh, section, and uh, the second uh, baby was born in a natural way, and I'm uh, now also pregnant, and I want uh, to have natural birth this time as well. And uh, this is how I want to, to show uh, to all women living with the HIV that it is not a verdict. Thank you very much. Thank you Good conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so now we have to close this panel, and now we go to our next uh, panel. And uh, I want you all to applaud to all our participants uh, and participants of this panel sharing your experience. It was uh, very valuable for us. And uh, just uh, in uh, a couple of minutes, we'll start our award ceremony. So today we talked about many initiatives, a lot of success stories, and we heard about uh, a lot of experience, uh, which I'm sure will be taken over by the countries and cities. We heard a, a lot of success stories, and we would like uh, to support this uh, success of people who did a lot of work to change situation in these countries and in the cities. And right now, uh, so at the initiative of In Your Power organizers, so this is the award we would like to give to all people who really deserve it. Uh, so uh, this is a recognition of contribution to HIV uh, response. 
So let's give a round of applause to people who will now get these awards. So I want to invite to this scene a mayor of uh, Atishinao, Ion Cheban. Are you here? Okay, Ion is here, so let's greet him. And uh, this uh, is uh, the award we would like to give to you. Um, maybe you have a couple of words to sum up our today's forum for you, and thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting. Actually, it was wonderful to spend time with all of you. I would like to thank Kiev, thank the mayor, thank organizers, and all those uh, who are uh, are holding this wonderful event, motivating and inspiring us all to do something where we are, where we live, uh, with the joint efforts uh, or on our own. So we have a lot of work ahead, so let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to continue, I would like uh, uh, to say about the real uh, successes in HIV and TB response. Uh, here we have uh, Kiev and Nikolai Pavaroznik, first uh, deputy head of Kiev city state administration. So, good afternoon again. So, here's your award. Thank you very much. Thank you, and if you want to say a couple of words. I'm very pleased to be here on this uh, stage in such a role. I think that uh, it is uh, an appraisal of uh, our a team uh, which I joined a little bit more than three years ago, then I had no idea at all about the fight that we had ahead of us. So in those three years, uh, we had so many achievements and now we have this award. So we can now plan what other achievements we want to uh, have in the nearest uh, three uh, years and uh, I would also like to say thank you to all the participants from the uh, Kiev City State Administration. So we talked a lot about the diseases, about the epidemics, and they have no borders. We need to keep that in mind. And only uh, such cooperation and partnership can help us uh, to uh, eliminate those diseases together. Thank you, Nikolai, and please don't go. Stay on stage because we will have uh, a group photo. And uh, I invite the mayor of Odessa, Gennady Druhanov. We invite you. So Odessa receives uh, 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 an award for a great contribution to HIV TB response. Thank you, Gennady. Uh, good uh, afternoon again, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. So I want to uh, tell you that this award is uh, really a recognition of uh, a lot of work uh, done by volunteers, uh, deputies, uh, municipal authorities. This was a teamwork, and it is great that today we see such good results. This will be a good incentive for us to move forward and we realize that we do something right. And you know, uh, the recognition of the importance of today's uh, forum, I wanted to say that uh, a couple of days ago we had a tragedy in the city of Odessa, and now together with the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, we are uh, now uh, looking for working on the site and looking for people who were injured in the fire accident. It was a terrible uh, tragedy for Ukraine. Uh, so uh, Odessa is united today. Uh, so volunteers are working. They are helping uh, people there and supporting uh, them. And of course, I should have been there now. And I was there for those two days and two nights. And of course, we had a lot of arguments, uh, like if I should stay there, uh, because of course, uh, right after this forum, I will go back uh, to this place where the tragedy happened. Uh, but the 
topic that we were discussing here today and what we are doing here today, it is also a big fight. It is a fight for our people, for our children, for our future. That is why today I was here with you and I would like to say thank you for all those who came and for those who today realized. And I'm thankful to Alliance for Public Health. Uh, Michel Kazachkin, thank you very much for uh, some time ago inviting me and uh, explaining to me this new philosophy uh, of uh, uh, treating those problems that are invisible but are very important. And I would like to say uh, thank you because we were talking about success today and I want to say a big thank you to uh, our hostess, uh, Yanina, uh, is a very right person uh, to moderate this forum today because uh, she is uh, really has this positive energy that we can all feel. So this is not just a host, this is a person who lives uh, through all these problems. And thank you for being with us. Thank you, Gennady. And dear friends, I would like uh, to invite uh, Maria Abzalbekov, uh, a head of uh, uh, the health uh, department from Almaty. Uh, so, uh, we have an award uh, for the success in HIV TB response in the cities. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, dear friends. Thank you for inviting me, and I would like to thank Kiev. We really like this forum, and I would like to say a big thank you to the organizers of this forum. And uh, we have achieved the first 90, and next year we plan to achieve uh, our set goals. So we really wish us and you good luck. Thank you. Good luck to you. And we see some golden package. I don't know who is it for. This uh, is from uh, Akhimat City Council of Almaty. We would like to present uh, to the mayor of Kiev. We are asking you to give it, give it to him. And what is inside the package? That's a secret. Okay. <laughs> Okay, fine. So, will you give it to the mayor? Okay, good. Thank you. I hope that it is legal. Yeah, it is within the law, right? And because we have a quota, uh, a certain amount up to which gifts are allowed to public officials. That's why I asked what was inside the package. And now I would like to ask Elia Matkazashvili, a coordinator of work with the mayor from Tbilisi, to get the award uh, in your power. So we want uh, to recognize your achievements and successes. Thank you for this uh, award. I'm very proud to be holding this uh, prize, uh, this award in my hands. Our mayor was not able to be here, but I want to assure you that Belisi supports all HIV TB initiatives because Belisi already signed Paris Declaration and Zero TB Declaration, and we hope uh, that we will move forward and achieve all our goals. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Irena Dimitrova, representatives of the mayor's office and director of the Department of uh, uh, Prevention, Sports and Tourism from uh, uh, Bulgaria, Sofia. So we have a team supporting her. So good afternoon. Pleasure to have this prize. Maybe this is uh, really a result from our effective dialogue with uh, non-governmental organizations, with uh, our professional expertise for, from Bulgarian uh, non-governmental organization, effective dialogue in Sofia, um, trace um, city council coordination culture, Council, and uh, we make first small steps uh, in the long, long way uh, to be near to the people, 
to be near to the need of our citizens with uh, networking, with really this uh, human heroes like our non-governmental organization. Thank you, ladies. Once again. Thank you. And for the brave leadership in recognition of the international partnership, Deputy Mayor of Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, Tatiana Kyrgyznetsova. Are you here, Tatiana? Please come to the stage. Bishkek. Thank you very much. That's a great and unexpected pleasure. And it was a very good uh, event today. And the fact that we are here at this stage uh, means that first we one team and we can go beyond the borders. And uh, our actions must unite us. And the most important thing is that we are the municipality, the civil society, and the people who are now in this situation. We are all together, and I think that our work will be the example of this unity. Thank you. Norbek Kadyrov, Deputy uh, Mayor of Osh in Kyrgyzstan, please, for your courageous leadership and in recognition of uh, the support from international partners. Thank you very much. It's a big honor and uh, we really can do such things. Thank you. Dmitry Alenikov, Mayor of Svetogorsk, Belarus. Please come to the stage to get this award. Yeah. We have Dmitry with us. Dear friends, I'm really happy to, to get this award and I want to say thank you to everyone who organized this event. We've seen Kyiv, we've seen everything related to that. Of course, uh, we will achieve 90-90-90 targets. The things we've signed for, we, are, we have committed ourselves to. So I'd like to say a few words to Norbek Kadyrov because we just met right here and we never knew each other before. I've, I never heard about Osh. Uh, yeah, it's not the first, but it's the second, but still the best. Uh, city in Kyrgyzstan. Dear friends, thank you very much for coming today, for uh, doing this uh, important thing together, and our moderator is uh, always with us, and it's difficult for her to support us so here in Kyiv, but thank you very much. We'll achieve the goals. Thank you. Thank you. Anna teleports that, that she, she should like accompanying you in Kiev, and it's going to be a pleasure for me to uh, give this award because of the event you know about. Uh, on the 2nd of December, to the, the mayors of three uh, cities in the region signed the Paris Declaration. That's a very brave action, but the main cities must understand that they have international support and they join international partners. So we uh, give uh, three uh, awards at once to Sonia Sisic, representative of Kazas. Uh, she's going to get three awards at once. But let me tell you, this is Podgorica, Baran, Belopole. Do we have Sonia here? Sonia, good evening. Please, for three cities at once, will you take it? Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. I said that you are a power woman. Because it's three kinds uh, here of awards, it's, it's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I must say that in Montenegro we are very happy to have uh, three mayors ready to take responsibility and to end dates. 
and I also believe that they have a huge support uh, of all mayors across the world who are ready to help and to exchange the knowledge. So please applause for our three mayors who were not able to come, but they're pretty much ready to work and to achieve 1990-90 goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Best regards from Kiev to you. And uh, and now we're going to have Okay. Here we have a deputy mayor of uh, Belty in Moldova. Is he here? Yes, right. I've been looking forward to awarding you. Nikolai Grigorish, and while he's coming up to the stage, I want to state that we are giving him the prize for the real improvement in HIV AIDS situation in the city. Yeah, thank you very much. We are a strong power and all together we will win with God's help. Okay, so now is probably the most uh, t touching uh, award because it's very uh, special when you uh, it's awarded not by some uh, committee of some award but by the civil society because it's so frank so I'm inviting the winner in the nomination from the uh, civil society based on the results of uh, the voting in social media and the initiative sites it's very difficult for me to tell you this in Russian sorry I'm too much used to Ukrainian so please I'm giving the floor to Irina Kutsenka the deputy of ADS uh, city Council, uh, she was voted for by the civil society for her proactive leadership, for example, and a true revolution that uh, happened in Odessa with her participation when fighting uh, HIV and AIDS, saving thousands of lives. Thank you very much. I will tell you this thing. The the first uh, to uh, raise the hand like this was our mayor. And thank you, Gennady, for being a real human, thinking about the people. I must say that that's a person who really think about people. And I'd like to thank you for this. And I'd like to say thanks to your team who are here. And that's the Department of Health. Valentina, thank you very much, and thanks to Vitaly Novosvitny, who has done a lot of great work, and Oksana Bradetska, I want to say thanks to representatives of the civil society organization, uh, Lena Gribova, and to the people from the community, Yulia Kogan, Kogan for delivering to us, to the politician, this uh, information about the real life. And I want to say to each person sitting here, everyone can change the world only if we start with ourselves. Thank you. Gennady Trofanov would like to add something to this. Yanina, thank you very much. Dear friends, I must say that you see Irina, I'm really surprised, not really surprised actually, yeah, I'm impressed by the fact that, uh, that this uh, award was given to the right person really, because I know how she, when she was nine she came to the Thai box in Odessa and started uh, doing Thai box and achieved uh, a very high uh, recognition in that uh, sphere. She, she she won European and World Championship, then she graduated from the uh, Law Academy, and at some stage I knew her since nine years old. I told her with your energy and your approach to things and desire to achieve uh, fairness, why don't you become a member uh, of the Council, because we need uh, such people. There are people willing to fight for good things. And she was elected, right? And uh, she's a member of it for several convocations. I'm a little bit, bit afraid of her because uh, she always wins. There is always some fight for good things. Thank you very much.
Yeah. So we congratulate you and thank you for doing things that you do. That's very important but because you were voted for not by the members of the jury, not the commission, but by the real people. And uh, to sum it up, to provide an award about the results of our forum, I'm giving the floor to the person who has been mentioned uh, on a number of times, that's Professor Michel Kazachkin, a special advisor of UNAIDS in the, the EECA region, so please, Michel. Thank you very much, Anina. Good evening, everybody. So today is coming to its end. This nice forum and dear mayors, dear colleagues and friends. First of all, I'd like to say on behalf of all present here and all the people living with HIV and tuberculosis in this region I want to say you a big thank you for your work for the things you do for, for I want to say thanks to all who signed uh, Paris declaration and stop TB declaration I thank you for your desire to truly fast track TB and HIV and hepatitis response at the level of uh, the cities and communities in the Eastern Europe and uh, Central Asia. And they said, and hepatitis. And don't, don't, don't mean that we want to sign another declaration. But truly, colleagues, let's not forget that 70% of people who t use drugs uh, and HIV positives in this region also have hepatitis C. And I, as a doctor, remember that in late 1990s, like we didn't have so effective uh, ways to treat hepatitis as now. And I remember patients with uh, beautiful CD4 levels uh, with a low viral uh, load uh, dying from cirrhosis and uh, liver cancer. So be careful about that. We are fighting against three epidemics in the region. And I would like to say thanks to the UNAIDS, IAPAC, UN Habitat and the Paris Municipality Council, that's uh, my native city, who initiated this fantastic global movement of the leading cities and of course on behalf of all I want to say thanks to the Alliance Tatiana Andre and the Global Fund for leadership in the regional programs and for today's great organization of this forum thank you You are the mayors, you are the role model, the leaders, and leadership for me is being the first or move the first in the right direction. And you are showing the way in a very clear way. And if we think and uh, try to remember what was here five or ten years ago, of course, I see, I think that one. A key element that we lack in fighting AIDS was uh, what we call the political commitment. This political commitment is a very uh, clear uh, recognition and understanding by the government at all levels uh, of uh, this extraordinary situation in uh, the, this emergency in healthcare, which uh, tuberculosis and HIV epidemics are, and the need to mobilize all the sectors because the response to HIV and AIDS is not 
about healthcare activities. It's about all sectors. We spoke a lot about fighting stigma today. We didn't say much about changing the legislation and policies. We need to actually achieve a decriminalization of the vulnerable populations of all of them. We must as we must uh, uh, stop uh, the imprisonment of uh, people who use uh, drugs and uh, people from other key populations. And it is clear that to achieve our goal in this region, we need to focus, as uh, we have been saying for uh, throughout the day today, we need to focus on key populations uh, and observe their rights, human rights. Of course, it is a human right to have access to the best available standards of treatment, and also it is a human right to uh, have access to services. All human rights are universal, and they belong to people who inject drugs, uh, to men who have sex with men. They belong to uh, sex workers. They belong to uh, people in places of confinement. They belong to migrants who become vulnerable to infections because of the difficult socio-economic circumstances, and they belong to sexual partners of all the above-mentioned groups. So today, I have been listening attentively to all of you, and uh, uh, to wrap up this day, I would like to offer uh, four the key measures for the governments at all levels, from the national to province and city uh, levels. So first, uh, I think that we haven't uh, been talking much about it. We need to have more accuracy in epidemiologic data that you collect. We are talking about cities, but the city of uh, Kiev is 3 million uh, people. Almaty is uh, a million uh, of people, oh, even more, right? 2 million, I'm sorry. So here we uh, see a big diversity. Those are just uh, many cities within one big city. So we need to ask a question, how well do you know your epidemic, the epidemic of your city? So in which parts of your uh, city something went wrong and uh, where you did something right? There are modern methods and ways allowing you to do accurate analysis to improve your choice of interventions. The second thing is that we need to focus the efforts and funding not only on treatment and 90-90-90 targets, but also we need to focus on prevention. It is also an important goal for us, a vital goal for UNAIDS to decrease the number of new infections. And if we have heard today that the number of new detected cases still goes up. Of course, we see some progress and we've heard about it today. Now we have uh, 650,000 people in the uh, region uh, receiving antiretroviral uh, treatment and it was a little bit uh, over uh, 300,000 in uh, 2015 and uh, about 200,000 in uh, 210. But the, we don't see uh, so much progress in prevention. Uh, so prevention is uh, underfunded. Prevention does not have the scale uh, that uh, it uh, should have, and often it doesn't follow the internationally recognized standards. 
Here I mean in particular primary prevention, such as uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis for men who have sex with men, and of course harm reduction for people who inject drugs. I say people who inject drugs. Let's uh, stop talking about the drug addicts. Those are not drug addicts, drug users, though the people who use or inject drugs. And the third thing is measures uh, to make sure that the government works in close cooperation and partnership with the civil society and with the communities. Because uh, the wide experience all over the world shows that uh, it is uh, the most effective way to respond uh, to HIV and TB. And the last uh, pillar, the fourth one, is uh, integration of services. So we have talked about it. So we should avoid the situation when a person has to go to one clinic to get methadone, to another clinic to get ART, and uh, to get a TB treatment in a TB clinic, and also to go to some forest clinic for hepatitis uh, treatment. So that's a question of organizing services which can be done at the local level. Thank you so much. So dear mayors, dear colleagues, I will just have a couple more words to say. So at the end of the day, we need to remember that the epidemics of HIV, tuberculosis, and hepatitis, they are still a vital health issue in the region. And when responding to those epidemics, we do not cannot go halfway. And there is no small progress. So either we lose or we win. So again, I would like to congratulate all of you over the signing the declarations. Now they need to be implemented so that we can see good results, uh, so that no one is left behind in the region, in your cities, to make sure that uh, we eliminate AIDS, uh, TB, and hepatitis in the ECA region. Thank you. So Michel Kazachkin today is here with us, and uh, we announce uh, that uh, the ECA City Health Leadership Forum is closed. So we did a lot of work today. We signed declarations. We uh, presented awards, uh, and the main thing that we did is uh, we uh, gave people the experience. We allowed them to share experience, and I hope that next year we'll have another forum where we will have see even bigger success. So thanks a lot, and uh, you, Michelle, and the participants uh, with the awards. We would like to make a group photo with you, and we uh, invite you all for the dinner. And glory to Ukraine! So please come closer and the photographer.